I'm Whoa. so familiar with that intro. <laughs> yes, yes, that's a that's a good one. I, it's changing eventually. I'm I'm gonna have to change it up. It's it, it's been going strong for not not a solid two years, but it's it's it's, it's time to update it a little bit. Some of that some of the stuff is still in 720p, so it's kind of affecting the rest of the videos. Yeah. But uh, hello and salutations, everybody. Uh, it's Two Cents Toys time, the way we played. And tonight, my guest is Tony Roberts, my very, very dear friend from Analog Toys. How are we doing tonight, Tony? I'm doing great, Sal. I've um, I've really, really been looking forward to this. First time on your channel. Um, as you said, we are very, very dear friends. We speak pretty much daily for the last, for at least the last year. Um, I've enjoyed the last couple of episodes of this with, with Ryan and Matt. And um, I'm just looking forward to sitting down and... Uh, having to having a chat about my childhood, you know, I, I had a pretty good, pretty good childhood. Um, you know, I've, 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 I've had some shit go on in my life, but uh, that's was in adulthood. <laughs> I had a very good childhood. So always happy to talk about it. Absolutely. That uh, I love this, sh this show particularly like, out, out of everything I do on my channel. This is probably my favorite thing to do just because it's, it's very low impact and we get to, I, I find hearing people's memories to be a great way to kind of, you know, first connect with that person on that level. And second, kind of remember some of my own and just kind of see like, you know, cause sometimes we do stuff that's, we, we assume no one else did. Then you find that person that did the same thing or we're into the same yeah. things or, and it's, it's always, I don't know. It's, it's fun to kind of realize I'm not alone in the world. So. <laughs> yes. Before we get started, we have our first super chat from Jody, or Gen X Toy Geek. He says, just cuz. Thank you so much for your donation, uh, Jody. I really appreciate that. And we have a lot of people in the chat tonight. We have Keith Knight's there. Hello. Hello. We got Epic Badger. We got Jody, of course. Gojatron's here. Kuma Chan's here. Jim Largo. What's it's action figure experts here we have a lot of people which is it's nice to see I'm, I'm glad that you're all coming out to support tony so i'm glad they're coming out to support two cents toys mate <laughs> yeah so we have a few questions tonight and this is uh not only is it your first time on the channel tony which i appreciate you taking time out of your day because it's just the start of your day uh, oh, it's my it's my absolute pleasure seriously sal i i've been looking forward to this this is not this is not work for me. This is uh, this is just going to be in enjoyable. So, absolutely, um, uh, very very much the same way on this end. It, it's never it's never work when it's your friends coming on. Yeah, but the uh, it's also the first time I'm having uh, to me someone international do the show. My previous two guests have been you know born in America, raised in America, so I'm very interested to see how that may have changed things in terms of like yeah. what was available and all that. And th there's a very specific question we'll get to later that, that I've been wanting to kind of pick your brain about regarding action force and GI Joe. Yeah, so, for sure. But that brings us to our first question of the night is a, you know, for those who may be listening and don't know somehow, like for those who somehow know me and don't know who you are, uh, just give us like a quick a quick synopsis uh, about you, uh, where you were born, when you were born, all that kind of stuff. All right. Um, just first, let's uh, let's thank Laser Pants for his uh, comments yes. in the chat. Much yes. appreciated, Ryan. Um, so I was born in 1977 um, in a in a town on the south coast of England, about an hour south of London. Um, the first, like, I, although I was born in 77, I consider myself an 80s child because, you know, I was born at the, ta the tail end of the 70s and my earliest memories would be from around 1980. Um, first toys I really played with were Fisher-Price Adventure People, then very, very quickly transitioning into Star Wars. Um, but I, as much as Star Wars had a big impact on my childhood, I... My memories of playing with, with Star Wars only probably lasted for a year or two. I quickly moved on to, to other things, one of them being Masters of the Universe. I got big into Action Man and Action Force. And then throughout the 80s, some of the other big toy lines. Um, I remember one year, or particularly one Christmas, being all about 18. 
Um, I had both the six inch and the three and three quarter inch figures. I had the 18 tactical van, stuff like that. The headquarters set, um, a, a long period where I was really into Coleco's Rambo because I was a huge fan of the Rambo films. I've always been into kind of military themed, um, toys because when I got my first action man and I remember this is one of my earliest memories, and I've told this story before, but I'm happy to tell it again. <laughs> I remember being in the backyard of my house in Goldsmith Road in, Eng in Worthing in England and being given an action man. And I don't remember if it was a hand-me-down toy from my older brother or if I was given a brand-new action man, but it was the, the basic soldier with the black beret and the rifle. And I remember like looking up at my dad going, what, what's this? Who's, you know, what's this guy do? And he's like, he's a soldier. He fights in the army and... I was like, I'm going to be a soldier when I grow up. And I, I, I ended up doing that. I ended up going into the, into the military later on. It all spawned from that, um, that connection with, with Action Man. So that's why, you know, subsequent toy lines, you know, barring obviously Masters of the Universe, they were all pretty much military-themed toy lines. You know, A-Team, Rambo, Action Force, Action Force International Heroes, all that stuff. So, <laughs> Yeah, I can... I can speak to that last part because uh, same thing happened to me. <laughs> um, <laughs> but yeah, and so let's see here. Uh, real quick, I just want to read uh, Ryan's super chat. He says, hello there. <laughs> oh. Yeah, you got to try and do it. The Obi I can't do the Obi-Wan voice. I don't do voices. It's, uh, it's not my thing. I'm, I just speak the way I speak. <laughs> no, I, I can try and I can butcher it, but. You know, uh, there's only one person that we both know that can do Obi Wan. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, um, you you mentioned uh, kind of passing in uh, that you only played with Star Wars very briefly, um, which is yeah. you know of course nothing to be held against you because I I believe I was talking to it might have been Michael on his retro talk. Um, and I, I'd mentioned that I very briefly played with Star Wars as well, even though I liked it as a kid. Once I got my hands on a G.I. Joe and all that articulation, I, I had a hard time playing with Star Wars. Like, because I would watch the movie, Luke would hold his lightsaber with two hands. And, uh, you know, the, the Star Wars I had growing up were the Power of the Force, two super buff ones. Yeah. And they still only held their lightsaber with one hand. That always bugged me. So, um, with that, kind of in the foreground was there any particular toy line um i guess similar in the vein of star wars that you either liked in passing or just really didn't care for that now as an adult you've kind of grown to appreciate well um ju just before i answer that question i'm just going to quickly go back to the the, the star wars thing and, and kind of explain why that was a very brief period for me mm -hmm. um because I don't think I saw the first film until 81. And I think I got toys first. So I got toys and I didn't really understand the context around them. Um, then I'm pretty sure Star Wars was on TV on Christmas Day of 1981 in England. Um, I watched it, fell in love with it, played with it all through 1982. Had a lot of Empire Strikes Back toys. But then, um, then I started to transition into Action Man and Masters of the Universe before kind of Return of the Jedi came out. Mm -hmm. um, and then by the time the Return of the Jedi did hit, I had moved on to other, other things. So, um, but now I've kind of back to your question. Action Man is the one toy line that was always there throughout my childhood. But mm -hmm. there was one particular Action Man toy, and I've, I've, I've got it here. I'm just going to... I got given this for Christmas, I want to say like 1982, is the, uh, the boxed mm -hmm. Action Man... Um, Space Ranger, Space mm -hmm. Ranger Commander. And I did not appreciate the Space Rangers whatsoever when I was a child. Um, it was it was not my thing. I was into the military stuff. So literally his outfit came off. He got dressed in the, into a military outfit and I never kind of touched the Space Rangers again. And I actually think I speak for quite a lot of Action Man collectors that all these years later, we now have a, a really newfound appreciation for that particular range of toys. It was Palatoy's way of, you know, following the success of Star Wars, trying to get Action Man in, into space. And um, having been a, a, a military slash adventure themed kind of toy line for 
you know, about 15 years by that point. Then all of a sudden, Space Rangers and Captain Zargon and Zargonite Pirates. Uh, it didn't resonate with me as a child. Now I'm a huge fan of that toy line. Um, and they've become... I, I remember when I got into collecting in the mid-90s, Space Ranger Action Man toys were like the cheapest things available on the market. They were in abundance. And you go on there now and they are just as valuable as the, as the other vintage Action Man figures around. So that, that's definitely the one for me that I didn't appreciate then, but certainly appreciate now. Uh, I see. Yeah. That's uh, kind of similar with me, like Motu. Like you've <laughs> I've been bombarding our group chat with Motu Origin stuff. <laughs> yeah. I, uh, only recently got into like a, I appreciated it from afar, but only very recently got into Motu to really kind of, yeah. you know, get into the weeds with it, so to speak. So, yeah, you've mentioned the uh, Action Man Space uh, uh, Space Ranger before. Now that uh, leads me into the next question, which I already know the answer to, but this is for everyone else at home. Uh, yeah. Were toys that you've held on to since you were a child? If there's any that remain in your collection today that you've had for the duration? Yeah, so to my my family, inspired by watching, you know, uh, there was a, a soap opera TV show called Neighbours, a popular Australian TV show that was very, very, it was more popular in Britain than it was in, in Australia. And in the mid-1980s, countless people that, you know, other families that we knew in England all had this dream of moving to Australia. Mm -hmm. uh, and my parents, you know, followed through with that with that dream. It was like an eighteen month process to try and um, get approval to emigrate, um, become, uh, you know, get a get authorization to become a resident of another country and be allowed to to work there. Like I think Americans would call it a green card. It's not a green card here, but that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. um, so in nineteen eighty eight, we um, in September of eighty eight, we moved from from England to Australia. And I remember in the summer of that year, my family having a garage sale to, to sell all this stuff that they didn't want to have to pay to ship it overseas. And they wanted me to sell everything, uh, all of my toys. I remember selling my Star Wars. Um, my, I don't think I sold my He-Man. I think I gave my He-Man to my younger cousin, Shane, because he was quite a few years younger and was still really into that. Um, but I begged and pleaded with them. I didn't want to sell my toys. And... They ended up saying, look, because I, I had all my toys organized in different boxes under the, the bed in my bedroom. And it was, you know, a box of Action Force, a box of Masters of the Universe, box of Star Wars. And I was allowed to keep one box. And that box was my collection of, uh, of Action Man. And I think I had around four or five figures, a heap of outfits. I had uh, a Jeep and a motorcycle. Um, and, and that was they were the toys that, that I that I kept. Um, they were very, very play-worn by then because half of the toys in that collection had not even been bought for me. My brother was born in 71. They'd been bought for him in the 70s, really well played with and then handed down to me. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, I, I was able to to bring my Action Man collection to Australia with me and I, and, and I still have the still have that collection today. Like, it's it has dissolved into the collection over the years to the point where I know it's all here, but I couldn't tell you kind of which, you know, which figure from my childhood is dressed in what outfit in the display behind me or mm -hmm. behind the camera, not behind me, Star Wars behind me. Um, and I had one particular favorite action man. He was my all time favorite action man. Um, I wanted, um, I had given him his own name, his own backstory, all of this kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And for many years, he was lost in the collection. When I say lost, I remember in, I think it was 1999, I've been a serious adult collector for about five years, and I bought my first display cabinet, which I still have in, in the centre of the room here. Um, and, and at the time, my collection was literally the size of it. It just filled that one cabinet, and that was the extent of it. Um, and my childhood action man, a lot of the uniforms and stuff I had when I was a kid were, were not displayable. They weren't mint anymore. There was a lot of broken guns. Mm -hmm. So he got dressed in, a, in another outfit. And for years and years and years, I couldn't find him. Uh, he was in the collection somewhere. And I found him, I think, earlier this year or late last year. And he's now, funnily enough, also dressed as a space ranger. Mm -hmm. um, 
I think he was on a motorcycle because his legs are so wobbly. You can see he can't stand up. He's so play worn. Mm -hmm. But the reason I know it's him is I took a hot match when I was a child and scarred the plastic on his right arm, a bit like when when Rambo falls through the tree in first blood and has to sew his arm up. Mm -hmm. um, so I wanted to give my action man a scar on his arm, which I, I did with a, a, the hot tip of a, of a match. And yeah, I found this guy. And now that I've found him, he no longer sits in the um, – in the case, he, he I dressed him in a Space Ranger outfit. He sits next to my uh, my video editing suite. And this is Michael Dusk Fox, who was my best friend when I was a child. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, it, I, I love hearing uh, those stories specifically because it's it, there's a connection to that toy that you so you you can't replicate it. You know, it's, no, no. There's only one way to get that. You know. Um, yeah. So we have two more super chats. Uh, we made a cardboard. I'll read yours in a second. Uh, Jody says, "Just cause." Mark two. Thank you, Jody. Thanks, Jody. Thanks. And a world made a cardboard actually is asking the follow up question that I had. Um, he says, uh, "Did you combine toy lines and play with different toy lines together?" He would play with Doctor Who, with GI Joe, and Star Wars figures. Uh, yes, I did, but it was always. Um, I did not mix scales, even like a, a, as a very, very young kid, um, I couldn't mix scales. So um, the fans of the channel know that my favourite superhero, certainly in childhood, was the Incredible Hulk, because I was a big fan of the, the Bill Big TV show. And I had the 12-inch in Incredible Hulk, so it was very easy for me to play Incredible Hulk with Action Man. Action Man figures would become different characters, and um, I believe it's in the very first... TV movie or TV episode of The Incredible Hulk. Um, uh, he, he, he lifts up a car, lifts up the front of a car. Um, so my Incredible Hulk was always lifting up the front of my Action Man Jeep to rescue someone who got pinned underneath it when the jack collapsed kind of thing. Um, so that, that was certainly one. Um, a lot of Star Wars toys would become generic vehicles in my Action Force play scenario. So the Land Speeder would always just become a generic car. I've got my recently acquired um, Palatoy X-Wing here. This is the one I had as a child. With it's the it's the white UK version with the battle damage stickers, the Chrome R two D two, the sticker in the back. Um, when I was a child, I always wanted the Sky Striker for Action Force or GI Joe. I never got the Sky Striker or the Rattler. The X-Wing would become my kind of subpar um, Sky Striker. Also. I remember when I played with Coleco's Rambo, um, the A-Team figures were not quite the same scale, but they were close enough that my mm. you know, imagination could bend that. So they would just become extra like cannon fodder baddies for uh, for Rambo to go out and annihilate. So, mm -hmm. so yeah, I, I did mix and match a lot of toy lines, but it was always based on scale. I, I would never right. have... Um, I, I wouldn't have He-Man characters mixed in with Action Force, although... Maybe not the action figures, but certainly Castle Grayskull. I remember that becoming like Castle Cobra for a long time in my mm -hmm. in my play scenarios as well. It became um, it became the, like the Cobra headquarters for me. Mm -hmm. And that's it wasn't a question I had written down, but it's definitely a topic I love to talk about: is scale. That does yeah. that, that's super important as a kid because even into the '90s when I was growing up and uh, the early aughts when I was still playing with toys, like you can always suspend your disbelief so far, you know, like, yeah. And I found that, uh, play sets in particular. And, uh, as I've mentioned a few times, uh, one of, one of my favorites, big, scary monsters were way easier to kind of fudge that a little bit. So if you had, uh, I don't know, uh, let's say the Kenner or in your case, the, uh, like the Sasquatch or the Bigfoot from six million dollar man, like you could fudge that into like a GI Joe or maybe Rambo a little bit easier just cause it's all, oh, it's a big scary monster. You know? Yeah. So, um, Timothy Ward, I'll, I'll, I'll come back to you, Tim. I see your question. Uh, scuba Pete says just cause winky face. Thank you, scuba. Thanks scuba. Scuba sent me a photo just before the start of this. He's got a, a bourbon and a cigar and I was like, I'm jealous, man. Oh. <laughs> Who's uh, set me in for the night to watch the show, I think. Mm -hmm. uh, if, I, if I were allowed to smoke in my apartment, I'd have a pipe right now. 
But <laughs> if I was allowed to smoke here, I'd just be uh, I'd be smoking cigarettes. <laughs> no fuss, no muss. They're they're easier. Uh, yeah. Timothy Ward has a question. He says, if you could have gotten everything, Star Wars, Action Man, Mask, Evil Knievel, Motu, all in one scale, is that the way you would have wanted it, or do you appreciate the variety that we now have? Oh, good, good question. Um, I, I really like the fact that both with Star Wars and Action Force slash G.I. Joe um, were in the three and three-quarter inch scale because you know it gave you the opportunity to, to, to play with all the vehicles, which... You know, I had an Action Man Jeep when I was a child, but I always wanted tanks and things, which they did make, but they were so big and so expensive. I know most kids I knew had like two vehicles at the most, and I and neither of mine were actually Palatoy ones. There was a a, a, a company called Shirley in the seventies who would make um, Action Man scaled vehicles, blow molded vehicles, and I had the Jeep and trailer from Shirley, and I had the German motorcycle and sidecar. But when it comes to like 80s properties, I did always wish that, and and I never had Ghostbusters when I was a kid, but I was aware of them. It was was a toy line that I kind of wanted, but I wish Mask had been three and three quarter inch scale. I understand the financial reasons why Kenna didn't do that. Um, But with things like He-Man, Rambo, Ghostbusters, I think if they had all been around five or six inches, um, it certainly would have given me a lot more play opportunities as, as a child. So um, mm-hmm. I don't say that I would have wanted everything in the same scale. I, I think there should have been like three standard scales, 12 inch, three and three quarter inch, and let's say six inch, mm-hmm. not like four, five, seven inches. Um, right. If they had just been like three standard ones, that would have been good. Mm-hmm. And that's a, a, a definitely uh, thinking about that question as well. And I'm like, I, I think it's only because we've been conditioned to see certain toy lines at certain heights. Like I have a hard time picturing Motu at three and three quarter. And I think maybe it has something to do with just the big larger than life physiques on all of them that them being three and three quarter, I think would just be bizarre. So, yeah, but who knows? Let's see. World made a cardboard has a super chat and he says, he guesses he was a weird kid because scale didn't matter to him different scale different planets and like yeah. I, and that that's uh to me that's maybe maybe i'm you know projecting or making assumptions but i think considering that you said that you used doctor who and everything that would be an easy way to kind of wish it away like oh yeah. we're in a new we're on a new planet people are bigger here you know yeah. smart See, I, I, I never had a Rancor toy when i was a child i've got one in the collection now but i know if i had a Rancor when i was a kid that could have been that would have been got used probably more in my Motu play scenarios, and I, and I know that because man, I, I've, I've just I, here's a memory that's popped into my head that I haven't thought of in years. My I had a Wampa toy from Star Wars when I was a child that was always used uh, with uh, with Masters of the Universe. It, it actually ended up living for years in the box of Masters of the Universe under the bed because whenever because the scale was just about right, you know, and it was another monster for He Man to battle, so. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's uh, pretty much uh, what I did. A lot of my big, scary monster types were used a lot in other places. Like, uh, um, I'm a big fan of Beast Wars, which is no secret. They got used with G.I. Joe more than they got used with each other. Bizarrely enough, that they would be in beast mode. Like, it'd be like the Rhino. The whole play scenario would be that... uh, the bad guys to G.I. Joe. Like I knew what Cobra was, but I didn't know who was Cobra with my figures. I just was like, this he looks like a bad guy, so he's with the bad guy pile. Um, they would acquire these animals. Uh, they went covert into a, a zoo and took all these animals. <laughs> and whatever mad scientist I designated that time turned them into robots and they would release them. And then G.I. Joe would be like, oh, we have a rhino running amok outside. They'd catch it, and then he would transform inside their compound. And they'd have to fight off the robot. Yeah. So, uh, Epic Badger says compact cuz for two dollars. <laughs> There's a trend starting here. <laughs> yes, yeah, it's it's, uh, it's the just cuz stream now. Yeah. Um, let's see. I'm having a hard time finding, but Keith Knight had a something there. It is. He says that. His favorite of all is 12-inch, 1-6, because... Let me find his part two. 
He loved the 12 inch scale because he could dress some of the other toy lines in the action man uniform and kit. Yeah. Yeah. I, I remember the, the only toy that I got from the Mego um, Star Trek, the motion picture series, um, the motion picture. I had other Star Trek toys, mm -hmm. um, but I got the 12 inch Captain Kirk and he was, he very quickly got rid of his, uh, his Starfleet uniform and got dressed up as a German soldier. <laughs> mm -hmm. So uh, I don't know if William Shatner knows that, but um, he, he, was, he was a Nazi in my house in 1981. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure he'd be fine with it. He's, he's uh, a bit outlandish and out there. Yeah. <laughs> so there, there's one, one question uh, that has been in the back of my mind just kind of over these last couple um, you made the great migration from England to Australia. We said around eleven yeah. years old. Yes, roughly. Yeah, just uh, just a couple of months after I turned eleven. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, uh, as, as someone who also went through um, uh, what I call the the great yard sale, kind of having mm -hmm. to sell off a lot of my toys, when you got to Australia, was there? How, how did? Uh, Gosh, how do I phrase this question? How how did toy buying and playing uh, affect you? Did you kind of try to rebuy the things that you had sold in England, or were you just so you know just start from scratch with other stuff? Or I um I'm I'm sure I brought. I know I've said many times that I was only able to keep one box of stuff and I sold everything else, but I'm almost certain that I um, I did hang on to some Action Force International heroes as well. I did bring my Cobra Hydrofall to Australia. Um, and when we, when we moved, like at the time, and even still today, it's very unusual to get a nonstop flight from Australia to London. So you always got to go via normally a country like Singapore or Malaysia and uh, you know, we as a child, I'd only been overseas once or twice. It was always to Spain. So I hadn't really traveled around the world. My parents were like, look, we, we're going to Australia via Singapore. Let's spend five days in Singapore. And uh, the hotel we stayed in just down the road, they had this huge, like, three-story Toys R Us there. Mm -hmm. And I remember going in there, and my parents bought for me Xandar and the Dreadnought uh, cycle or tricycle whatever it is mm -hmm. um but that was the very first time that i understood the connection between gi joe and action force because it was called action force international heroes in the uk and then i walk into this toys r us in singapore and this wall of what i thought was action force and i walk up and i'm like why is all this stuff called gi joe um so so they they, they, pick, they pick me up that toy um and then i arrived in australia and i was still playing with with toys at the time um for at least another year, I remember getting a, sm a couple of small mini play sets. Um, uh, I don't know, there was like a forward observer set and maybe the Cobra rifle range were like the first toys I got in Australia. Mm -hmm. The following year for my either my birthday or Christmas, this is probably the last toy my parents ever bought me as a child, was the Cobra Mumba. Mm -hmm. um, but I found going to school in, in Australia, even – all the way back then, it's, it's it's a very very different culture because Australia is such a warm country. Um, there were a lot of kids back in the eighties who weren't asking for toys when they were children. They mm -hmm. wanted um, a cricket set or a, a, a boogie board or you know a, an outdoor basketball hoop. Those were and and with um, in Australia, you know the seasons are different. So Christmas summertime here, a lot of kids are asking for that. So I remember when I first went to school it was actually very hard for me at the age of 11 to find other kids at school who were into things like action force. So my first sort of best friend in Australia, we connected because he read GI Joe comics. He collected the toys. Um, and, and one memory that, that I have not shared before. Um, Cause I only just thought when I, you sent me some questions the other day and I was thinking about it. Uh, when we first arrived in Perth, we stayed in a, in a rental property for a while. Um, and then my parents built uh, built their own home, which is a it's still a big thing in Australia. You can it's very easy to well not easy, but um, it, it's it's actually cheaper to build a home than to buy an established home. Um, mm -hmm. It just you know 
for that 12 month period that you're building a house, you have to rent somewhere else. So, but my parents built this, this house and um, it had a large, what we call a games room in Australia. And as soon as we moved into the house, my dad's like, right, I've got a games room and that room is designed to have a pool table in it. So he went out and he, he bought a secondhand pool table for a couple of hundred dollars. And he was looking forward to, you know, Friday nights, inviting friends around playing, playing, shooting pool with his friends Little did he realize that a large pool table is a perfect green play area mm -hmm. for action force. And he would come, he would invite friends around. He, I think he used to play indoor cricket or something on a Friday. He played some kind of a sport. Um, and then afterwards, he would invite some, some guys from the team around, you know, the guys and their wives for drinks. And they'd go in to shoot pool and find that the pool table was covered with, you know, the tomahawk and action force figures or ram whatever whatever it was um and that was uh that, that was a, a really really f fun way to play I'm, I'm just trying to remember i wonder how many um small weapons actually got lost down the the pockets of that pool table god knows mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah that's uh i found and it, we'll, we'll, we'll talk about it later play sets both found bought and imagined but i find that yeah. thing, things like pool tables or long kind of i guess dressers or even a kitchen table with a nice kind of cover over it became mountains very quickly yes um yep. go to tron has a question which is actually was going to be a follow-up question after you mentioned you know the christmas and outdoors uh he asks hi sal and tony did you prefer to play with action figures indoors or outdoors and to kind of add my addendum on that the what was there or were there, I should say, were there designated outdoor toys for you? Like things you just um, did not play with out, like inside, outside? Oh, uh, no, nothing that was solely outdoor, but Action Man um, was definitely one that, that did both, you know, because um, the, the Jeep and trailer was, was quite large and it was, you know, when the weather was nice in England in, in the summertime, it was much more fun to play with Action Man in the in the backyard or the, or the front yard. It, it didn't matter. Whereas I, none of my other toys, I don't think, ever went outside. I never played with any of the smaller scale toys out. They were always, you know, on the living room floor or in the bedroom with Star Wars and Action Force. But yeah, Action Man did both. Like yeah, when when the weather was was cold, I would happily play with Action Man indoors. But if the weather was nice, there was nothing better than. Um, getting your action man geared up, putting him into the Jeep and driving him around in the backyard and getting him mm -hmm. a bit dirty and digging some foxholes and stuff. So, mm -hmm. Yeah, that's my uh, the, where I grew up is very rural. So there was people had big yards, not because it's like, oh, we can afford all this land, but just because people, it was sparsely populated. And yeah. uh, we had uh, what one would call, quote, a sandbox quote, which was, a sandbox only the only the loosest definition of it being four pieces of plywood with sand in it yeah and th yeah. that would be that would be tatooine or that would be the desert oh, yeah. or until you know a neighborhood cat shit it and then it was something else <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah but since we're on the topic of you know play sets inside outside and all that kind of stuff i, I wanted to know how how did you feel about like legitimate, you know, purchased from the store play sets versus, you know, your imagined ones like the pool table, for example? I I always wanted the play sets. I never got that many when I was a child. I did have Castle Grayskull. I'm trying to think of what other big. I had small play sets like Checkpoint Alpha from from GI Joe. I had that. I had the Cobra. Um, the Cobra Bunker, like small <laughs> mini play sets. So I always wanted the play sets, but um, yeah, my, my, my parents couldn't afford to buy me big play sets. You know, if I was lucky, I'd get a large vehicle and, and, and that was it. So, but um, I can remember the first year in Australia, and I know it was the first year in Australia because we were in that rented house for that first year. So 11 going on 12. Um, at that time in my life, I was really, really into like Vietnam War movies. Um both realistic ones like Platoon and Hamburger Hill, but also some cheesy ones like Missing in Action and Rambo 2 and that kind of thing. And I've got a photo somewhere of me dressed in um, in camo pants. I've got a black 
sleeveless T-shirt with printed uh, belt links across, like M762 link belt across them. So I'm wearing these camo pants and this camo hat, and I'm down. Um, there was a small passage down the side of the house that was all sand, and you can in this photo you can see I've dug foxholes, I've got mm -hmm. small branches, and I've tied um, tied around to make um, basically it was like a, a prisoner of war camp mm -hmm. um, from Vietnam, and I had a guy in, in a pit with a wooden like cage lid over the top of it. Um, so I would just let my imagination run with me and um, create create my own fun, and that was a good thing with action. That's why Action Man was kind of the outdoor toy because. You could do that. If you did that with Star Wars, you're going to lose all the accessories. You're not mm -hmm. likely to lose Action Man's accessories doing that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Quickly, Jody says he has to drop off. So thank you, Jody, for showing up. It was a it was a pleasure having you here. And yeah, I, I know it's late there, Jody, but um, thanks uh, thanks for being here. Appreciate mm -hmm. it. Uh, Shav Gord has a question, uh, which is great because I had one and it totally just left my brain. Right, right <laughs> when you stopped talking, I was like. I don't remember what I was going to say. Uh, yeah. Shab Gold asks, Tony, what did you do with the Sea Wolf for Action Man? Um, so for those of you who, who don't know, the Sea Wolf is, um, uh, is, a, is a submarine. A submarine. It was actually, it, was, it came out as part of the uh, G.I. Joe Adventure Team line as well. It was recolored for the UK market. Um, I never had one as a child, so... Uh, there is a quite famous Action Man advert where he gets you know, submerged in what looks like some kind of a pond and there's fish swimming around. Um, but I did have the deep sea diver and he was um, he was like bath time Action Man. He, he would always get um, uh, get put in, put in the bath. Uh, I, I enjoyed that. But yeah, I, I never had the sea wolf as a child. So, mm -hmm. Yeah, that and uh, <clears throat> sorry, excuse me. Uh, World Meta Cardboard reminds me of... Uh, I'll, I'll read his chat real quick. It reminds me of what I was going to say. He says that he made a Death Star playset. He also used several boxes to make his own Bespin playset. Because earlier he'd mentioned that he was producing a lot of his own made out of cardboard, which explains the screen name now. Um, yeah, yeah. But uh, I was going to kind of offer up my memories of playsets where uh, I wasn't a fan, really. Like there, there were a couple I, I distinctly remember. Um, the straw that broke the camel's back in terms of play sets. My, uh, my grandmother for my birthday, Christmas, one of those two had gotten me the daily bugle play set, which was for the toy biz Spider-Man figures from the nineties. And it yeah, was basically I remember that toy. Yeah, like two flanks of cardboard with some plastic stuff in it. And I hated that play set. <laughs> it was awful. Cause there was pretty much there. There were no, it was like cardboard and action gimmicks is pretty much all the thing was. And I found that play sets limited my imagination. Like I had to play within the confines of the play set or, you know, then I was, I couldn't transition from here's a physical backdrop and things to interact with to the carpet with, you know, the cat or something like that. Yeah. Yeah. The, there was a break in that kind of, in that play flow. And the things like the Cobra Bunker or like the little play sets, I liked those more because I could, you know, make a cave out of books and put that in there. And that, you know, became part of the environment that way. Yeah. I, I remember as, as a child, one, one play set, <coughs> excuse me, one play set I really did want as a child. And actually since one I still want today, I don't have is the Action Man Electronic Command Center, which is designed to look like a concrete pillbox. Mm -hmm. um, I always wanted that as a kid. My parents couldn't afford to buy it for me, but fortunately for me, I have a my, my grandfather was a very very talented carpenter, um, and you know, I'm, I'm when I was a kid, like half the furniture in our house had been handmade by him. The the kitchen dining room table was had been made by him, and things like that. And when he got wind of the fact that I wanted this pillbox and they couldn't afford it he made me one out of plywood and he also made action man scale furniture so um some some cots for for action man to sleep on a, a chair and that became my all-time favorite playset when i was a child god knows whatever happened to it um it got played outside with a lot so it didn't last but um uh yeah it had um it, it had the slit in the pillbox and and everything like that and he basically an open back so it was the sides, the top, the bottom, and and the front with like the the gunnery slit, um, and you could you know play with it um, 
through the open back panel, and uh, that was a, that was a, an amazing, uh, amazing that you know your grandfather can make this thing out, out of wood with his own hands, and it becomes one of your your all time favourite toys. Um, yeah, good times. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's. And I, I like hearing those kind of stories, especially like that. He, you know, not only had the skill set, but was like, you know what? This boy needs something. You know? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. My, 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 my brother also had my, um, the Action Man training tower. If you haven't seen that before, mm-hmm. it came out in the G.I. Joe Adventure Team line as well. It's a huge orange, um, it's, it, it's it's a training tower. It's kind of designed to look. Oh a yeah, bit yeah. Like... It, it's got like the green square that kind of opens up at the bottom. It has. It's made out of almost like a vinyl over cardboard, almost. No, 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 no. That's that's the headquarters. This is okay. a, a modular. So it's all orange, and it's made to look like steel frame. I don't know why okay. they made it out of orange plastic. Mm-hmm. Um, it almost looks like a large like uh, power pylon. You know, all this this mm-hmm. steel structure that goes up to the top. Um, and it was the training tower. It had a cargo net that they could climb, a ladder at the top, it had a flying fox. And it's literally about four feet tall. It's enormous. Yeah. Um, and when my brother's toys got handed down to me, there was all these parts and pieces to this training tower. And I was like, this thing is awesome. And I'm sure I'd seen a, a picture of it in a, in a, in a toy catalog somewhere as well. Mm-hmm. But this thing's awesome. Like, you know, dad, help me build this and put it in the backyard. I want to play with it. And we quickly discovered that, you know, my brother had played with it so much, it was so badly broken, we couldn't assemble it. And mm-hmm. again, granddad to the rescue, he's like, I'll oh, just make him one out of wood. <laughs> and he made this huge four foot tall. It was, it was bigger than me at the time. And they designed this own little flying fox that could be attached to it. So between that, and that would have been around the same time that he'd made this like pillbox for Action Man as well. And I had these two awesome, you know, wooden Action Man play sets uh, for the backyard that were just so much fun. Mm-hmm. More durable too, I imagine, significantly. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, I'm not sure what this chat is in reference to Kuma Chan, but it does bring up a question that I had. He said, "String from bathroom to front door, 45 degree angle." I'm assuming that's a zip <laughs> line of sorts. Um, yeah. It makes me think of Web Store, which um, I was going to ask how you felt about action figures with gimmicks growing up, like how. You know, He-Man had the twist waist or Fisto with the, you know, the spring-loaded fist. If you found those aided playtime or if you felt limited by having to use the gimmick or, you know, it's kind of how collectors nowadays when like someone like me, when I buy Marvel Legends and I have a figure that has, you know, their head is molded as a screaming head. Like if I want to take a photo, I can't have them sitting there drinking coffee, for example. Like, <laughs> Yeah. Um, well... As a general rule, I've never liked um, play uh, play feature gimmicks in, in action figures. I didn't like them when I was a child. I don't like them today. There are some exceptions, like um, the first wave of Motu that came out, I didn't mind the spring-loaded waste. That didn't bother me. Mm-hmm. Um, it's when they kind of... Because the, the posability with the Masters of the Universe figure, you know, they're not incredibly posable, but, you know, you can still use the arms and the legs. It's when they um, – like Ram Man, I think, is a terrible figure because he's mm-hmm. just got that spring-loaded gimmick and that's it. He's got barely any articulation. Um, Web Store was one of my favourite Motu figures when I was a child because that was – that, to me, is not – because the gimmick was not incorporated into the figure. It was right. part of the right. accessory. Mm-hmm. Um, so accessories with that kind of kind of gimmick was was really fun. But um, uh, I mentioned before that I was very interested in Ghostbusters and kind of wanted them, but I had to you know choose another toy line. I'm glad I never got into Ghostbusters as a child because beyond the first wave, they destroyed that line with all of these mm-hmm. weird gimmicks with eyes that pop out and ridiculous stuff like that. Um, I think I mentioned in a video recently that i believe that had kenner not incorporated um play feature gimmicks into uh god what's the toilet the the superpowers line Mm -hmm. um if they had have gone with more like 
didn't even necessarily have to be like GI Joe level of articulation, but maybe an elbow. But they had knee joints, I think. They had knee joints, anyway. Um, but elbow joints um, where you could pose the figures as opposed to them being stuck in the same pose because of the play features. Mm -hmm. If Kenner had have not used the play features, I think a lot of us would be sitting around today going. That's up there with one of – I mean, it, it is still a very, very good toy line. It displays beautifully. Mm -hmm. um, but I just don't think the kind of the playability was there. If they had gone with articulation over play features, today we would be saying it was, you know, one of the greatest 80s toy lines ever created. So, mm -hmm. Yeah, that's – knees and elbows help immensely. <laughs> like just, you know, look, look, like looking at Mask, for example, you know, those, those tiny little figures which – I only know what I what I know about Mask. I've learned vicariously through yourself and Michael. Like I never, I didn't know what Mask was until I found your channels, because um, it just wasn't something I saw in the house. And to me, like the fact that what, what are they in the two point five or the three inch scale Mask is, um, yeah, two point five. I'd say they're, they're they're considerably smaller than Joe's. Mm -hmm. I would say that the fact that their their knees are able to bend helps that line out a lot. Especially oh, yeah. putting, them, yeah. putting them into a vehicle. That was something I hated as a kid when legs didn't have knees and they just went whoop and went straight forward. And I had to <laughs> wet. I'm like, that's not how people sit in a car. But yeah, yeah, like like you know, Luke pretty much um when he gets into his X Wing, he's like he's like on the sun lounger, he's laying back to get a tan. You know? mm -hmm. So um, speaking of, of Webster and uh, or web, web store, sorry, not not the dictionary. Uh, I only yeah, yeah. we only observe the Oxford Dictionary in my house. Um, the uh, play play features like his. I, I had this conversation with Matt Swafford, and I agree there was something innately, inherently, undeniably cool about grappling hooks <laughs> as a kid. Oh yeah, <laughs> yes, Which yeah, is, yeah. It's such a bizarre thing. I think it was just because, like, if you were playing on the ground, you know, your legs would get tired or, you you know, your legs would fall asleep or whatever. You'd want to stand up. But, you know, if your figure didn't fly, then you're like, well, you know, Duke can't fly without a jetpack. But if he has a grappling hook, he can play on the wall. Yeah. Like, it was – I had this uh, – uh, this is – it's going to segue into the next question, I promise. Um I had this thing. Um, it was like a, I don't know where the idea came from, uh, but I probably saw some movie that had something similar and it just embedded itself into my, you know, child brain. But I had a prison uh, for, for my characters because I, I, G.I. Joe dominated my playtime. It, it always circled back to G.I. Joe at some point. And I had this, uh, this wire kind of pencil holder thing it was like just a wire box for lack of a better word with no lid but the space was big enough for me to uh had this uh, uh grappling hook mountain climbing hook whatever it was and the the hooks separated from the top so i'd put the top through the wire mesh and then reattach it so then i could hang it from a string and i would take two pencils and uh tape the string between the pencils and then wrap tape around the pencils and put them uh, in my window and I would dangle it from outside of my window. And that was the prison. That's where they would go because they couldn't <laughs> escape. And I'd, I'd set it up so I could like rotate the pencils to reel it up and all that kind of stuff. And I don't know, some grappling hooks, just super cool. And so that leads me into my, my question about, uh, about playtime specifically. Like were you, did, did you just kind of plop yourself down in one spot and, uh, I recently rewatched Retro Blaston's video about the top play sets that you didn't buy, and he talks about the blanket, the duck and, blanket, yeah, the duck blanket. It, what, did you plop yourself down in one spot, or did you kind of use use the space, so to speak? Like if you were playing in one corner, this was the good guys' headquarters, and the cat corner in that room was the bad guys, and you played everything in between. Everything in between. So I, 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 my memories. Of, of playing in childhood were that like um during the week after school i would play in the bedroom and i had a bed that was um certainly we 
the, the town where I was born, I lived there till I was about seven, I think. And then my dad got another job and we moved about half an hour away to another town. And I got more memories of living in, in that town than anything. And I had a bed that was kind of raised off the ground about so high with cupboards and drawers underneath. Mm -hmm. um, so that would, you know, my bed would become a, a, a mountain top fortress for Cobra. And, the, you know, the, the Joes had to use grappling hooks to scale up and that kind of mm -hmm. thing. Um, but then weekends were certainly in the mornings. Um, the toys, you know, a box of toys would come down into the living room. So I lived in a two-story house, so the bedroom upstairs. Mm -hmm. uh, come down into the living room, and um, I would pretty much play on the floor because I would often play while um, watching a, some sort of a film on VHS on, on the TV. I remember me and my sister used to argue all the time over you know, who, who would get to put their tape in first because she would want to watch Dirty Dancing and I'd want to watch Rambo or whatever. Um, but yeah, even in the living room, um, you know, the couch became terrain, it became a hill or something like that. Um, what, what, whatever, whatever I could use, um, you know, it would become some kind of an environment. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's... I found that uh, I, I didn't discover that until later in life. Like I used to just sit down wherever I was is where I was. And then because I, I have an older brother and we shared a bedroom for the majority of my childhood up until, I don't know, probably I was 10 or 11 years old. And then when he, you know, my eldest sibling moved out, he moved into her old bedroom. And I had this all of a sudden to me, massive bedroom. And so I was like, oh, I can. You know, there's not two beds in here anymore, and I can play over here, and I can do this. And slowly, playtime started to encroach into other places in the house, and then went yeah. outside of that because I grew up in an old farmhouse, and so there was like rundown buildings on the property and all that. And I would, you know, go out to those buildings, and that's where the less desirable characters would hang out and live and hatch their schemes and all that. Because yeah, yeah. you know, there's oh, there's actual spiders and everything. No, not Australia spiders, mind you, but you know, <laughs> scary enough to a 10-year-old. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I know, to, to your point about grappling hooks, the other really, really cool um, uh, sort of play feature that you'd get with some action figures when, when you were a kid, or the one I, I, I loved grappling hooks and ropes and all that kind of thing, but the other thing I really liked as well was parachutes. Mm -hmm. um, I had an action man, a parachute for action man. I had a parachute for action force. Um, so I, I never had a, so the, the G.I. Joe Sky Striker came with a, an ejector seat and a parachute. I didn't have that. Mm -hmm. And it might have been part of the, the, the star scheme, the mail away scheme, but I remember just getting a parachute backpack for action force mm -hmm. uh, or, or G.I. Joe. Uh, I'm playing with that a lot, and I've, I've got a distinct memory. As I said, I lived in a two-story house, and my bedroom was at the back of the house, and you could open the bedroom window and look straight down into the garden. Mm -hmm. And I would often, um, to, 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 to get an action man parachute to work quite well, you've got to get throw it up pretty high. And if I'm standing in the backyard, and I, I could never get the height. You know, he needs a bit of time to allow the shoot to properly deploy. Mm -hmm. But I could do that if I got the extra height by throwing him out of the bedroom window, uh, which was something I used to do a lot. You know, I'd love, you know, deploying the, the parachute. And I remember one time doing it on a really, really windy day, and I've kind of thrown Action Man up in the air. And as the parachute's deployed, the wind's taken it and blew him into the next door neighbor's yard. Oh, no. <laughs> And the most disappointing, like we were friends with the neighbours, but the most disappointing thing is, you know, they were out somewhere and mm -hmm. my parents, you know, they would never let me hop the fence or anything uh, next door. You'd have to go and knock on, you know, say if you kick the ball over, you know, my parents taught me you've got to be polite. You've got to go and knock on the door and apologise and ask them to get it back. And it was like a, it was like a Saturday or something. All I want to do is play with Action Man all day and he's stuck in their yard until like 7 o'clock at night when they got home. Mm -hmm. So, Oh, yeah. Guess that was the end of that play scenario, real quick. Yeah. <laughs> so there was, um, well, first off, uh, Brian Dillingham has a question and he asks, What do we think of the final faction line? I, I, I think they were really interesting. I, I, I enjoyed that retro blasting video. Um, it's nice to see, first of all, it's nice to see actually action figures on pegs in shops. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's. 
Um, it, it, it's great to see them there. Certainly won't be something I, I'm going to get into and, and start collecting. As you know, I'm not m much of a modern collector anyway. And if I do collect modern, it's because it has some kind of link to a retro property like Origins or Black Series Star Wars or even the, the new Action Force, you know, because I'm, to me, the new Action Force is the evolution of the Action Man story from the, 12, the original 12-inch Joe to the British 12-inch Action Man to Action Force and now this kind of new mm -hmm. um, iteration. Um, but, but certainly if my, if my son was a little bit younger, um, I would probably be buying Final Faction um, figures for him to play with, definitely. But he's not. He's 14 now. He's going to start chasing girls. Well, I think he's already chasing girls. I don't know. He doesn't oh. tell me. <laughs> yeah, it's it's coming. Yeah, that was, that was kind of what happened to me with toys. I was like playing with toys, and about his age, I was like, "That's a pheromone." <laughs> so, yeah, um, but I'm I'm actually uh, I'm very I very much enjoyed the final faction. I have uh, all the main characters and probably like twenty aliens now. Yeah, so, cool. Um, and yeah, that they're Dollar Tree exclusive which sounds really weird to say, but <laughs> yeah. every, every Dollar Tree I've been in, they're there. So yeah. I've never not found them, which is refreshing. So, Which is normally the case with anything called exclusive. But, yeah. Right. Well, to, in my mind, you know, perhaps I have a lizard brain or something, but I'm like, if it's, an, if it's ex exclusive to that store, like if I were a s store, you know, store... I don't know, spider butt or something. And I had an exclusive figure that I was carrying in my store. I would make it my duty to keep that in stock because it's exclusive to my store. They have to yeah. come to me to get it. You know, it's not like, you know, I, I'd understand if it's like, Oh, I'm getting this figure, but so are the other eight stores around me. While I would want that sale, I wouldn't feel the pressure to keep it in stock. You know, I'd be like, Oh, well, yeah. you know, but I, I don't have that corporate mindset. So that's probably why. I, I was joking recently that the Target exclusive classified Cobra Island figures, mm -hmm. um, it, they actually made a mistake advertising it. It's um, it's not a Target exclusive, but actually exclusive to Cobra Island. And until you can find Cobra Island, you're not going to get yourself a major blood. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. I, I was on the uh, Infinity Equation yesterday with uh, Ryan and Dante. And I watched the show. It was good. <laughs> yeah, I'd made the joke. I was like, I wonder how long until we have to wait, or how long we're gonna have to wait till there's a Cobra Island classified exclusive in a Monopoly game. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, so, for sure. And just watch Absolutely. grown men fight over Monopoly because there's a figure inside of it. Oh yeah, and that, and they'll put um... someone important. Like they'll they'll be like, oh, we're gonna put I don't I don't know. They'll they'll put an army builder in there, and it'll be. Um... A really cool army builder, like um, like a cobra eel. It'll mm -hmm. be like the only way to get a cobra eel. Like, it, it, I, I've got a few classified figures now. Like I've I've made no bones about it. I was not a fan of the first wave whatsoever, um, but I did pre-order the deluxe version of Snake Eyes, and since then, um, I've been gifted a couple. I've acquired a couple. I've actually got. Um, in honor of your your normal avatar, I've got to my uh, uh, desk yes. here. <laughs> I've just been uh, filming a video that features, um, well, it's all about Destro, not just mm -hmm. the classified figure. Um, I've lost my train of thought now. I don't know where I was going. <laughs> That's all right. Um, uh, it, yeah, so uh, I, I was really not a fan of the first wave. There has been a lot of stuff that's come out subsequently um, that I have enjoyed. I, I, I picked up Zartan just because it looked awesome. I personally mm. am not a huge Major Blood fan because – when I got into Action Force International Heroes, which was the British version of the G.I. Joe continuity, Major Blood was not a major character. It was kind of a little bit after that when it was more, you know, uh, Zata. It was like the Flint, Quick Kick, Bazooka kind of era. Um, but if they, if, if the Cobra Eel is probably my all time favorite Cobra figure, if mm -hmm. they brought out a classified version of the Cobra Eel and it looked good, like it's got to look good. Um, I would be so tempted to army build that, and I just know that they would do something stupid like bring it out in a Cobra Island, give Monopoly mm -hmm. game or something. It's, uh, yeah, and then no less, it'd be like the one figure they do that's like to the nines, like the original look. Yeah, yes. And they'd be like, oh yeah, we just we just took the three and three quarter, blew it up to six inch, gave it more articulation, 
and then we shove it in. It wouldn't even be Monopoly. It'd be something like shoots and ladders or something like that. <laughs> yeah. Which, if they were going to do any kind of themed board game for G.I. Joe, and I promise after this we'll get back to our you know conversation about being a kid, I could, I could see them doing a Risk board game G.I. Joe themed. If they're going to do yeah, anything. Well, well uh, maybe a bit like... Um like they've done with the Star Wars retro line, they they brought out those two exclusive figures with board games. So Grand Moff Tarkin came with the Death Star board game. They didn't invent that board game. That's an old Star mm-hmm. Wars board game. So I remember I had the G.I. Joe, I think it was called Live the Adventure board mm-hmm. game, um, which I believe was part of the 86 line. That's when like we had Lieutenant Falcon come into the story and that kind of thing. Um, so I could see them doing that, just recreating that old G.I. Joe Live the Adventure board game and, Sticking the figure in there, I don't know. Mm-hmm. Which, uh, f- full disclosure, before we move on, watching you and Bobby and everyone sing all these praises about Zartan, I, I bought a Zartan. <laughs> I, I it saw is... it. Yeah, I it's... saw it in stores yesterday or day before yesterday. But it was Saturday. Whatever. When you're on night shift, days have no meaning anymore. Um, whatever day it was. And I saw it in stores, and I was like, "Yeah, that's he's pretty good looking." Like, if they were gonna do any kind of updates, they did it well with him because they didn't add a bunch of hockey pads to him. Yeah, but, yeah. <laughs> so Wolfie has a super chat for us. Thank you, Wolfie seven six two. He says, "Sal, Tony, are you planning on getting slash customizing the Kenner Classics Ecto? I really want to do an all in light sound custom. If I find one for retail, saw it. It's a Walmart exclusive." Uh, personally, I am not only because I didn't get any like Ghostbusters is as much as I love the movie. I don't have any emotional attachment to the toys. Um, I've seen the retro collection or whatever they're calling it uh, a handful of times. And I just, it's, I appreciate what they did. And I like that. It looks like really, really good as compared to the originals, but I just, it's not something I'm really into. So for me to buy an Ecto, and then customize it. I'd, I'd just have a customized Ecto-1 with nothing to go with it. Yeah, and I, I think, first of all, I want to point out, I don't know if you deliberately misspelled that there, Wolfie, but I like that you called it Wolfart exclusive, and not Walmart. <laughs> um, um, I recently acquired the original Kenner Ecto-1 thanks to Matt Swafford at Reclaimers Vintage Toys. Um, it, it was actually a pure coincidence. I... I messaged him saying I was specifically on the hunt for for that toy because I'd recently acquired the the firehouse and I wanted to make a video and didn't feel I could do the video without the Ecto-1. And when I messaged him, he just so happened to be um, in discussion with with some lady who was selling her brother's collection and he had an Ecto-1. So for the reason I've got an original vintage one, I won't be getting it. but it, uh, it it does look good. It it looks like a very accurate recreation of the original. Like the the, the figures that they brought out uh, was it last year? Mm. Um, they are very accurate re- reproductions of of the originals with improvements. Actually, like they've used a more pliable plastic on the Neutrona ones and the hand grips, mm-hmm. so that you're much less like the the plastic isn't so brittle. You're not going to break them. I think you could drop these guys. Um, you know, don't like throw it you know, baseball pitch into the wall or anything, but you could probably drop one of these and then the, 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 the uh, proton streams won't break on them. They've got a bit of flex to them. Um, but certainly for anyone who would like to customize that with, with like light and sound features, um, that'd be the way to do it. You know? Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, it would, it would, it would be to, to, I don't know what they're going to retail for, but um yeah, that that would be cool. I'd like to see Toy Poloi do something like that. Pick up one of mm-hmm. the um, the re-releases and you know get all the lights on the top of it working. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's. I I can picture in my brain how I would do it, but I'm I don't think I'm going to. Um, yeah. <laughs> Kuma Chan has a kind of funny joke. He says board games, as I called them <laughs> as a kid. Yeah, bo- board games were something that we did when the power went out, and. There was nothing else to do when I was a kid. It yeah. was mostly mostly card games. We card games were easier. Board games you had to set up and had to know the rules and all that kind of stuff. But and uh, Wolfie confirms his Tony. Yep, it's Wolf Art. 
Their exclusivity <laughs> evil corporation with Hasbro deserves much a worse name. It, it does. As someone who used to work for them uh, over 10 years ago now, they're terrible. They're they're pretty bad. If you think they're yeah. bad with their exclusives, you should see how they treat their people who work for them. All right. <laughs> so, oh, let's see. What were we... So, talking about playtime, right? Um, nope, it's gone. <laughs> so I've got um, I've got some other memories from from childhood as well. Like um, um, I'm trying to think what the what the vehicle was. Um, no, it's gone from my memory now as well. What's what's what happens when you get old? You see, you, you, yeah. Too, too busy. You always lose it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, I do have one question, though. Um, so, talking about, um, you know, you made the great migration and, you know, you couldn't bring your friends yeah. with you, obviously. Um, how, how was it? Because um, mo- most people, when they move, um, it's like a town over, or sometimes, you know, people yeah. move across country or whatever, but. N- most of the time it's not super far and you know you can kind of maybe keep in touch with your friends how, how was it uh well first did you have you know your, your normal mates that you played with in england that you just played with all the time like get down the street or the neighbor or yeah well f- f- for me when i was a child <laughs> pretty much still the same today um so I, I mentioned earlier at the age of seven we moved you know a few towns over it was like a th- 30, 40 minute drive away. Um, that was at the age of seven. And I don't ever remember having any kind of anxiety about making that move because I was one of those kids who um, was friendly with all the other kids in school. You know, I was I, I was never bullied. I, I felt like I was kind of liked by most people. Mm-hmm. But, um, but when I would come home, I would want to live in my own world with my toys. Like the, I, I was so... That's so why I've become this, you know, lifelong toy collector. They, they meant so much to me as a child that I enjoy, I was very, very comfortable in my own company. I've, I, don't, I don't think I've ever felt lonely in my life. Um, I'm comfortable in my own company. So making that move from one town to another at seven really didn't bother me, didn't have a lot of anxiety. Mm-hmm. Then when we, when we lived in this other town from the age of seven to 11, um, again, you know, I got on well with the kids at school, but I don't remember many kids from school ever being invited around the house on the weekend. There were a few kids in the street that I would kind of play with, but that would be more when we would go out and play. Mm-hmm. I was still more than happy to just spend a weekend in, in my bedroom playing with my action force figures or whatever. Mm-hmm. So when it came time to moving to Australia, um, I had the benefit of the fact that my parents had been talking about this for close to two years and, you know, we never actually knew if we were going to get the okay from the government to move there and that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. So over that time, you know, they were uh, watching as much stuff on TV about Australia, whether it be films, TV shows, documentaries. I remember my parents going to a big seminar in, in the, in the city of Brighton, um, where some people who had made the move a number of years earlier were kind of, um, they're you know, sort of talking to people who wanted to move to Australia and giving them tips and advice and a bit of a Q&A thing and everything. So by the time we went to make the move, I was actually really excited because my my sister believed that she was going to go and live on Ramsey Street, which is the street featured in the neighbours' sit, um, uh, not sitcom, sorry, uh, soap opera, mm-hmm. um, which, you know, shout out to Michael French. That's how we first got introduced to Kylie Minogue. She was an actress, a young actress on this show with Jason Donovan. So my sister thought she was going to live down the street from Carly Minogue, and I thought I was going to go and hunt Barramundi with Crocodile Dundee. <laughs> Turned out not to quite be that case, but I really looked at it as this big adventure. And and this this particular action man I have here, he wasn't dressed like this at the time, um, but he got he got dressed in an outfit, and I had a, a kit bag with some spare equipment. And he did not get shipped over with all the other toys. He actually came with me. He was my my travel companion. Um, when we went to Australia. So, um, yeah, I looked at it really as, as an adventure. And um, I'll always, I've always thanked my parents 
for making that move, even though in my early 20s, I wanted to go back and see England as an adult. And I ended up staying there for close to 10 years. Mm-hmm. Um, travel is one of the best educations you can get in the world. And, the, and mm-hmm. taking us at, at, at that very influential age, like just before, you know, you hit puberty and stuff like that, where you've grown up in one country and then you go and live in another country, it gave me, even in my teenage years, I think a much broader worldview than a lot of my peers. Um, mm-hmm. Uh, I, 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 I started to have a lot more friends in my teenage years, as in, you know, I, I, as I said, I was not a lonely kid, but um, in my teenage years, you know, when you start, as you say, when you start smelling pheromones and stuff, mm-hmm. I, I would I would tend to go out a lot more and uh, used to go to the beach a lot. I tried to become a surfer and failed miserably, but I did attempt it for quite a while because um, it seemed to be all the girls in Australia preferred surfers to anyone else. So, right. you know, if you... Uh, yeah. As someone who has also lived in uh, another country, it's you, I can, can 100% confirm that is a very quick way to learn about world. Because if you yeah. only, you know, traveling to another, another country is a little different because you're like, oh, you know, you're there to visit and, oh, this is neat, but you're going back to the yeah. same old, same old, but you're living somewhere else. It's makes you appreciate things that you have, things you took for granted and, really kind of broadens your perspective, lets you know that that little bubble you grew up in your hometown is inconsequential because there's bigger things going on. Yeah. I've, I've still got a friend from high school. Um, in, in high school, actually, most of my friends in high school, I joined um, Army Cadets at the age of 13, and the school I went to didn't have an Army Cadet program, so I had the option of going to two other schools and um, – uh, it was the year that I was turning 13. I went to go to the local one and they said, no, you can't join actually until your 13th birthday. Whereas mm. we went to this other school for the army kit and they said, no, no, we'll take you at the start of the year. If you turn 13 that year, and cause my birthday's in the middle, I was like, well, I get another six months. Mm-hmm. So throughout high school, all of my friends that I would socialize with outside of outside of school were friends from army cadets. A lot of which didn't go to my school. Um, but the one kid who did go to my school and was in army cadets with me for a long time, um, I haven't seen him for a few years now, but I did bump into him probably about three or four years ago. And, you know, we, we were probably around 39, 40 years of age. He has still never left the state of Western Australia. And I was like, geez, man, <laughs> mm. you know, not, not knocking people who don't travel, but it's, it's so educational to the point where um, I, I, all the time I spent doing private security in Iraq, I would be in Iraq for nine months a year, and I did that mm-hmm. for four years. I consider that I actually lived in Iraq. Mm-hmm. I was yeah. there for so long. Yeah, um, you, you lived actually, in Iraq. You just took vacations. Yeah, pretty much. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. It wasn't like in the military where you do a tour for six months or 12 months. I took a full-time job and stayed there for over four years. You know, I pretty mm-hmm. much lived there. So including that country, I've actually lived in four different countries. I've lived in England, Australia, Thailand, Spain, and, and Iraq, and it's the, the best education I've ever had. Absolutely. Uh, world made a cardboard. Uh, he's, he's pouring in some heat, Tony. He says, <laughs> okay, Tony, I've seen you play with your evil Knievel toys, so confess you still play with your toys, don't you? He says he does, and he just turned 50. <laughs> Well, it, it, it's one of the enjoyable things about having a, a YouTube channel. When I make videos, like the, the fully produced videos, I hate the script writing process. Um, I don't particularly enjoy sitting down to record all of the, the audio um, and the pieces to camera. I was filming that stuff yesterday for this Destro video I'm working on, and I, I, I had this picture bit where I'm talking directly to the camera and I flubbed the line like 15 times. I was starting to get frustrated with myself. Um, but the really enjoyable part is as, as tedious as shooting all the B-roll can be and time consuming, I really, really enjoy that. Like just this morning, I was filming all these different shots of all the different Destro action figures that I've got. And this this six-inch classified one here, I set him up in a little diorama and I took some ammo crates from the Rambo mm-hmm. Savage Strike headquarters and 
I put all of the Valiverse weapons next to them, and that's how I play with toys now. So yeah, I'll, mm -hmm. I'll admit it. That's how I play with yeah. toys now, and it's uh, it's to bring you guys content. Yeah. So <laughs> yeah, I'm the same way. Like, because for everyone listening at home, Tony and Michael get to see my thumbnails and everything else before anyone else does. Because I'm always like, is this good? Is the lighting good? Which one's the best out of these ones? Because I'll set up a couple, or I'll change the colors around and all that. And yeah. I find doing that, like, it's it's really weird. And may, maybe you know what I'm talking about. But, like, um, think, thinking back to your, uh, what, what brand was it? It was the, the dragon that you bought. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, was that Imagine Next? Is that, is that who that was? No, it wasn't Imagine Next. It was um, Zuru, I think it was called. Okay. Um, yeah. And uh, I find... You know, so, some toys I buy are for that very reason. I find my childhood brain kicks in and I start running through these play scenarios, like looking at this toy that I may not recognize. And the same thing happens when I set up these photos. Like I, my brain starts churning about like where I would go next, like what's going on in this shot kind of thing. And the desire is there to play out that scenario. And I'll make it about two seconds in and be like, I feel stupid. And I just stop what I'm doing. <laughs> Like, even though no one's watching me, I, I talked about this with Ryan. I called it the shame that we all get when we turn teenagers. Um, and it's like, that's just me. I, no one else is here. But I'm like, no, I feel dumb. <laughs> Maybe it's, uh, you know, if if you're doing it... Uh, for a shot for a video, that's maybe how you can get away with it or something. Mm -hmm. um, here, here's a... Here's a little uh, announcement. I'm going. Maybe I shouldn't reveal this secret, but I don't think anyone's going to go and beat me to the punch with this. But uh, one of the videos I'm I'm going to make for Iconicon is going to be the review of the Masked Boulder Hill playset that was very kindly donated by uh, by Jody. And you know, if anyone is familiar with the Masked Boulder Hill playset, one of the play features is this spring loaded. There's a turret that comes up out of the top of the mountain, and the boulder on the top goes rolling down the side. I'm going to film Indiana Jones running away from that boulder, um, and I'm actually going to play with, with that doing it. So, because um, again, you know, the idea popped in my head, and I was like, "How cool would this have been if you were a child? If you had Boulder Hill and you also had Indiana Jones toys, you could almost recreate that scene from the beginning of Raiders of the Lost Ark where he's running away from the boulder." So, uh, mm -hmm. so, so I'm going to try and recreate that in toy form for the video. That's going to be awesome. I, I, I hopefully I, I can pull it off. Um, mm -hmm. I'll, I'll see because every time I try and do it, the, the boulder wants to go in its own different direction. So uh, right. we'll see what happens. <laughs> yeah, I, I imagine it's going to be one of those very frustrating things. And when it's done, it's going to look great. Like anytime I do a stop motion for the channel, well, stop motion in air quotes, because what I do <laughs> yeah. is, is hardly stop motion. But like the one I did for New Year's took me hours to film. Yes. And such a pain, but it looks great. That action figure expert has a question, and I think we both already know our answer, but he says, question for both of you. If there is one last toy that you could have, what would that be, knowing that you can't, like, if we can't get any other toys, we can pick or save one, what one would it be? Um, if there was one last toy that you could... So, so to, uh, action figure expert, I think what he's saying here is, if I could add one more thing to the collection okay. and then nothing else, what would mm -hmm. it be? Is that, I think that's what he's saying. I, I maybe I, I read it as like if we could only save, like pick one toy. But okay, let, let, we'll, we'll do it both ways, just in case. We'll do it both ways. Yeah, yeah. Um, you want to go first? Uh, sure. Um, if it, if I, if I was able to pick one of my toys to save and not buy any other toys, it would be my uh, general flag from GI Joe. It was the first G.I. Joe I ever received because um, I had my brother's hand-me-downs, but I didn't know what they were. The, the first G.I. Joe that I know was a G.I. Joe was my general flag that my dad gave me. And it's the only toy that, um, well, un until recently, was the only toy that I knew about anyway that had survived the yard sale and where I sold my collection in 2015-ish. So I've held on to him ever since I got him as a kid. So I would pick him every day of the week. Yeah. Yeah, I, I would obviously pick this guy, but I, if I was allowed to, I'd probably change the outfit he was dressed in if, if everything else had to go. Mm -hmm. um, 
But if you look at the question the other way around, as in like if you could only add one more toy to your collection and then you had to stop collecting, mm -hmm. I think a lot of people in the audience would expect me to say the USS flag. Mm -hmm. um, but that would not be the case because if I was to get a USS flag, I would also want to go and get another Sky Striker mm -hmm. and a few other things. So if if I if I was to get the flag and then I couldn't get anything else, I wouldn't want the flag because I wouldn't have enough other Joe vehicles to put on it. Um, I've got one Sky Striker. I think you kind of need two to go on the flag and mm -hmm. um, that kind of thing. So if, if there was if there was one other toy I could add to the collection and then you know, would then would have to stop collecting. Damn, what would it be? Right, right now, off the top of my head, it would be a Y wing from the vintage Kenner Star Wars line. I reckon that would be the if, if, if I could get one more toy and then I had to stop collecting, it would be that. Oh, well, good news! About three days after everyone's caught up and watched this, you'll probably have ten of them on their way. <laughs> I, 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 before anyone rushes out and does that, I actually think Michael Schaefer is, uh, uh, is sending me one. So I, I know Michael Schaefer is sending me one. It's not complete, but I'm looking forward to restoring it. So he's got a nice complete one in his collection, and he had one that was missing a few bits. And I was like, yeah, I like the challenge of um, reassembling an old toy. So mm -hmm. if, let's see, if I could pick one final thing to acquire, um, so yeah, that puts me in a difficult position because I also collect modern on top of vintage. Um, yep. Let's see. It's now like you normally like my my brain goes to the flag because I'm like oh that's you know it's hard to get complete it's big yep. it's like it's considered like the grail for a lot of GI Joe collectors but like you said if you don't have everything to populate it. And then it just it's a coffee table, and I, I don't have very many. <laughs> I have more Cobra vehicles than I do Joe vehicles, yeah. um, which is weird because I think the thing I would pick is the Cobra Bug. It's this garish, oh, cool. yeah. neon submarine, like amphibious yeah, I know the Cobra ship. Bug. Yeah. yeah, I don't know what my obsession is with that vehicle. Why I love it so much because it's it's garish. And it's it bulbous and everything, but I, I love it. I don't know why. I just do. Yeah. <laughs> um, Keith, Keith Knight in the, in the chat here is saying the VAM fire tender. For those in the audience who don't know what VAM is, that's a very common expression um, um, in Action Man collecting circles. That just means vintage Action Man because we had the Palatoy era from the 60s through to 84, and then Action Man came back again in the 90s under Hasbro, um, which a, a lot of vintage collectors aren't particularly fans of so you have van and man which is vintage action man modern action man mm -hmm. um but actually now that keith says that actually the vintage action man fire tender which is this huge red fire truck with a, with a ladder and a working hose and all this stuff that actually would be an amazing um mm -hmm. addition to the collection i, I would I, I would be happy if i added that to the collection i can could never collect again so mm -hmm. Which, the the more you've talked about uh, the modern action man stuff, there there, I had this Christmas where I got a bunch of the twelve inch style kind of GI Joe figures, and I never knew what they were, and I'm kind of looking at photos of them like off and on, and I think that's what I got because I have it's nowhere near me. Or I would show you, I have this kind of uh, old style looking carbine rifle that's made out of this kind of soft plastic that you know, warps and yeah. bends and all that and um i think i told you the story about the medic station that i had with the casts that clipped on and had yeah, a gurney yeah. and all that and it's very fragile and brittle and i'm thinking like the more i think about it i think that's what i got that christmas was a bunch of that stuff because i remember they were gi joe scale but like their elbows and their knees actually moved and their feet actually had like articulation in them where the yeah. other gi joes were mostly just big dog toys yeah, yeah. But, <laughs> so, let's see. So, now that we've discussed that, uh, da, 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 get rid of that. I will pull up my other questions here that I've somehow misplaced. <laughs> All right. Here we go. So, uh, da, 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 I, I want to know how, how your playtime 
kind of changed? Like when, when, when you played, so as someone like my, myself, I didn't, I didn't have, even though the source material existed, I wasn't privy to most of it. Like the He-Man, I, I was born right in that, what I call the, the dead zone between the eighties and the nineties. So I was able to watch things like Power Rangers, Batman, and the X-Men cartoons when I got, you know, a little older. But I was born, G.I. Joe was off the air, He-Man was off the air, uh, Ninja Turtles, I think, was on the air. But by the time I was old enough to have memories of it, it was gone. Um, were, were there any toys that you had growing up where there either was no source material or you didn't know what it was? And how did it incorporate into playtime? Um, well, Ac Action Man has never had any source material, um, and that's okay. actually one of the things that I liked about it the most, mm -hmm. is that um, for the most part, obviously, you know, barring Space Rangers and that kind of thing, the Palatoy Company just offered you all these different adventure sets, military sets um, for your figures. So he could be a British soldier, an Australian soldier, a German soldier. He could be a mountaineer. He could be a polar explorer. Mm -hmm. And the rest was left up to your imagination, and that... Um, that's actually what resonated with, with me the most because um, as much as I enjoyed a lot of those kind of retro franchises from, from the 80s, be it Star Wars or, or Action Force, you were limited by the rules kind of of, of mm -hmm. that world, whereas Action Man could really become anything you wanted him to be. Mm -hmm. um, and, yeah, my, 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 play, my playtime with Action Man was – I, I could have on, on the weekend, I could get the whole box of stuff out and, you know, have a, have a battle on the living room floor, do, do whatever. Um, but then also I was comfortable to leave the rest of the toys away and just have my action man and have him, you know, get out the rope and grappling hook and have him mm -hmm. try and scale up to the window ledge and it would just be him against the elements trying to climb a mountain kind of thing. So, mm -hmm. um, but yeah, we're then with, um, with Star Wars, like once you, um, I, I've never lost interest in Star Wars. I've I've always enjoyed Star Wars, but you kind of move on to other things, and it's um, so a, a really good thing with with Action Man actually is that the versatility of being able to change that. Obviously, it was limited by what outfits and accessories you had, but for for a child who is really into military type movies. I could watch Chuck Norris missing in action mm -hmm. and I'll write, right, I need to get a plain green uniform. I need to get one of my action man that's got blonde hair. I need an M60, put a headband on him, and now he's Chuck Norris. And I could, you know, recreate the missing in action movie with, with action man. Mm -hmm. I could also go and watch, um, man, I've just remembered something. My mum, when I was a child, because I, I was quite into... I wasn't a huge Bond fan, but um, I, I did like James Bond. Mm -hmm. And my mum was pretty good at sewing. She made a black tuxedo suit so I could turn Action Man into James Bond. And I hadn't thought about that in years. Mm -hmm. um, so that, that versatility there, you know, Action Man could then all of a sudden, he could be James Bond. For a long time, my Action Man was... Um, to David Banner, the alter ego mm -hmm. of the Incredible Hulk as well. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so versatile, something that you couldn't really do with, with other toy lines. I do remember distinctly that first year in Australia in that rented house. Um, I believe Predator had come out. It had already come out before we moved to Australia, but I didn't see Predator until the first few months we were in Australia. Uh, we, uh, we rented it on VHS, and I loved the film. And then I traded my Cobra Hydrofoil, which a lot of people know the story. I traded the Hydrofoil with my friend's Tomahawk. And I had different G.I. Joe characters who would become the different cast of characters from Predator. And they would fly into the jungle, which happened to be my front yard at the time. A uh, in the jungle. Tomahawk. Hey? A literal oh, jungle. <laughs> pretty much. There was, a, there, was a, there was more vegetation in the front yard than there was in the backyard, so it was probably in the front yard. But, yeah, the tomahawk would fly them in, and I would recreate the Predator movie, and I think it was Toxo Viper was the Predator, mm -hmm. um, you know, because he had that, had that weird mask. It kind of looked a little bit like it. Um, but, you know, you, you were – I always wanted the figures to look more like the characters in – the film than what they did like i think um 
I think maybe Repeater, I think it was. Um, you know, Repeater, he's got that like 50 cow on the uh, mountain on his waist. He was obviously blamed because he had that mm-hmm. kind of gun. I can't remember which figure was Dutch, but I know he carried the M16 with M203 from Leatherneck because that's the mm-hmm. weapon he had in the movie. So I would swap the weapons around. Mm-hmm. Um, but to try and do something like that with Action Man, if you had all the different accessories, you could, you know, make them look a lot more like the characters in the film. So, mm-hmm. yeah, that that's uh, r- really quick. We have a super chat from James. Uh, it's either Salzburg or Salzburg. And he says, Adventure People. Yeah, I played with Adventure People quite, quite a bit. I made a video about it recently. I had that one. I'm sure I had more Adventure People stuff. Um, mm-hmm. But there was two pieces that I remember having, which was the the Aero Marine search team set with the helicopter and the submarine. And then I had this single like space vehicle. I'm sure I had more, um, but that stuff would always get used with, um, with action force and GI Joe as well. Mm-hmm. Not the, the figures so much, but certainly the vehicles um, mm-hmm. for sure. Yeah. That's um, speaking about source material um, that I didn't mix my toy lines much as a kid. Um, like I, I would mix play sets and vehicles more often than anything else. And yeah. it's because of those, you know, the, you know, who would win between these two people, like He Man and I don't know, fucking someone else. And <laughs> it was one of those, like, uh, do, do I really want Darth Vader to fight with GI Joe because he has the Force? And then I have, like, I was very much. I, they had to live within the confines, like the rules that were in that play scenario. Yeah. And it was like, well, if he has the Force, then I have to find a way to justify it, like. He's from yeah. <laughs> like it, it was very much the kind of how the MCU is trying to be very grounded in reality. It was very much that when I was a kid, I was like, well, yeah, you know, if I have this giant robot, well, that's how I was like, oh, they got, you know, they're animals from a zoo. And then this happened and that happened. That's why the robots now, like I had to kind of make that up in order to justify it. Yeah. And Timothy yeah. Ward has a question, which I think we've all experienced this. Says, did you ever have a well-meaning family member unknowingly buy you the wrong toy, and you had to put on an Academy Award-winning smile performance to try and cover it up? Yep, <laughs> I discussed it in my um, completing my Action Force International Heroes collection video. Um, and you say I had to put on an Oscar-winning performance. Unfortunately, I didn't put on a performance. I openly. So I, I was trying to collect the this, this set of 20 carded action figures that were released in the UK in the Action Force line in 1987, and those were characters like Flint, Lady J, Scarlet, and all that. And it got down to, like, the final present on Christmas Day. Um, there was one figure left that I needed, um, and I got given an action figure-shaped present, and I opened it up, and, I, you know, the figure I needed was version 1 Storm Shadow, and I ended up with two telly vipers, and my auntie damn well knew that I was not happy. <laughs> mm. I'm trying to think if there's any other examples of that. Um, quite, oh, actually, yeah, when, when I did put on the Oscar winning performance, it was getting the Space Ranger Commander from my grand, I think it was from my grandparents on my mum's side. Um, I was still really appreciative of having another Action Man figure because um, I didn't have many figures. Um, but it was like, man, why, why couldn't you have gotten me the SAS guy instead of the, you know, the the, the one in the blue rubber Space Ranger suit? Mm-hmm. So, um, but I certainly would have put on an Oscar-winning performance for my grandparents. On, um, mm-hmm. I, I, I absolutely adored those people. Mm-hmm. That was, uh, yeah. I found, you know, when Grandma got you something, it was a little bit different than some aunt that you see maybe twice a year. Yeah, uh, I. I have a, a memory of that, and t- I cannot remember the toy line. I absolutely cannot remember it. Um, Stretch Armstrong had made kind of a revival at some point in the yep. 90s, and it was one of the spinoff lines of that. That's all I yep. remember about it. And I had wanted one so desperately bad for Christmas, and it was not quite Christmas. It was like a family gathering where the extended family would exchange things and then we'd have Christmas proper on Christmas, you know, later. And yeah. um, I don't remember who gave it to me. It was like an aunt probably. Cause I know it wasn't my grandma and it looked like an action figure. Like it had 
you know, long back and something on on the front. And I was like, oh man, this is it. I've been talking about this. I've been wanting it. And I was all excited. I opened it up and it was a coloring book with a pack of crayons, like a big pack of crayons <laughs> in the front. And I remember just sitting there wallowing in defeat. <laughs> and I got a very stern talking to because I guess I hurt my aunt's feelings, but I was probably nine at the time, maybe 10. And it's like, I, I don't know. She well-intentioned, but it's like, you know, kids that age aren't really, you know, they don't want a coloring book. And it was like, like animals of the farm or some, some generic coloring book. Yeah. And uh, uh, beyond that, I think I was telling Ryan this story. It was either Ryan or Matt Swafford. I don't remember one of the two. Uh, the last action hero had uh, that movie with Arnold Schwarzenegger had come out yep. and there was the, the figure of him dressed up in the trailer for Macbeth and he shoots like a skull out of his hand or something. I got that figure three events running. I got it for my birthday, Christmas birthday, or it's either Christmas birthday, Christmas, one of the two. I got it three chunks in a row. And by the time I got to the third one, I was just like, I have this one already. Like there, I couldn't. I, no, I, uh, so I grew up with three of those in the house. Yeah, but and, and a cruel twist of fate with that figure that what I was talking about. I actually got one that following Christmas. The Stretch Armstrong, whatever it was, worst figure ever. Hated it. Couldn't stand it. I played, <laughs> I played with it one time, and I was like, this thing sucks. Yeah. So, uh, Brian Dillingham has a super chat, and he says, "Get to the chopper." I I can't do an Arnold accent at all. I don't I don't do I said it before, I'll say it again, I don't do voices. I, I can't even do an Arnold. Um, yeah. We'd have to get Michael on here to do that. Yeah, yeah. Um, Dante does a really good Arnold. <laughs> he does. He does. Let's see. Uh, action figure expert has another question for you. He says, yeah. question for Tony, do you army build anything? And if so, do you have a limit? Yeah, I, I army build a few things. Um, so Action Man SAS figures um, and also uh, German Stormtroopers. Uh, well, I say I, I, I'm not continuing to army build, but I've got quite a few of both of those figures. Um, I also like to – I've got quite a few of the SAS squad leader from the Action Force line – um, stormtroopers, although I, I feel I've got enough stormtroopers, I've probably got one, two, three, four, five, six. I've got about seven stormtroopers. That's enough for me. Uh, but normally, when I army build, um, I, I would like to. I would like to get a few more Cobra troopers, but I would be happy with like three or four. That, that's it. Mm -hmm. I don't need massive, massive amounts. So just a little, a uh, little squad of them. So mm -hmm. that's a. Uh, uh I'm kind of the same way. I, I don't need like some like I'm. I know you've seen these guys that have you know hundreds of stormtroopers just all set up, and it's impressive. But I'm like that's that's that's, that's a lot of dusting. That's a I don't want to. Have <laughs> yeah. that, that I um I can kind of understand that. Um, I don't think. I don't think collectors should you know they should limit it like you know so don't limit it like I do to like you know you know, four to seven figures, you know, but surely if you've got 30 stormtroopers in your collection, that's enough. Mm -hmm. I've seen collections where guys have got literally hundreds and hundreds. Um, I don't think that's fair on other collectors, but the very weird phenomenon, which I think is only really a Star Wars thing, is focusing, mm -hmm. where you'll see a guy's got a collection and he's got like, you know, 150 Gengars. Like, what is the point Mm -hmm. uh, I certainly understand people who collect very. I'm not huge into variants, um, but certainly in the, in the Action Man line, um, the German Stormtrooper is a good example. Technically, I'm not really army building or haven't been army building the German Stormtrooper, but it first came out in 1967, the German Stormtrooper outfit, and it stayed in the line right up until the early 80s, I want to say. And the outfit changed considerably, like the, the, the visual differences. Um, so I've got pretty much every variation of the German Stormtrooper, which would be one, two, three, four, five, uh, about six different variations. And actually, there's only one of them where I've got two of the same. So technically, I'm not army building and there's variations. But mm -hmm. Yeah, that's... Uh, I. 
I, I army build a little bit with my modern stuff, like stormtroopers and all that. And I normal I get enough to have a squad, usually yeah. like five, six, like the action force, uh, the Valiverse action force. I have six swarm pre-ordered and one wasp raider. <laughs> Yeah, so I've got the officer and six drones. Like it was only going to be five, but I was like, no. And this, this plan I have for the thumbnail is like I need a sixth one. So it's it's. I told Bobby what it's going to be. I'll tell you off air. And I, I oh, it's going to be hard to set up, but I'm gonna. It's going to look great when it's done. Yeah. Um, Shab Gold asks, did you ever pass up a fig a figure or set that you did not have the cash for and that you regret now? Oh, there's been a lot of things over there. So certainly going more back to into the 1990s where I was in my late teens and then early 20s, I started collecting. Um, I started to become an adult collector at the age of 16. But you know what it's like in your late teens, you know, your first mm -hmm. few jobs, you don't earn massive amounts of money mm -hmm. um, and you're not very wise with your money either. <laughs> um, you know, I've, I was... I've, 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 Straight out of school, I went into the Australian Army and we used to get paid every two weeks on a Wednesday, I think. And I'd get paid on a Wednesday and I'd be broke by Saturday morning. And, you know, mm -hmm. <laughs> um, so there's a lot of things I, I, I passed up. But the one thing that really sticks out to me is I remember when the movie Small Soldiers came out, mm -hmm. um, you know, where the, the toys came alive. And, you know, it's not a bad film, it's not a great film. But I remember seeing the toys in Toys R Us in Australia. And in, even back then, I was like, man, these, these will be collectible one day. There was just something about them. Mm -hmm. um, and I really wanted to pick them up and couldn't afford it. And it wasn't kind of for an investment thing. I just knew. And all these years later, I would still like to have um, a set of small soldiers. And mm -hmm. I can't remember the character's name, but he's like the, the lead character of the, uh, of the bad Hazard. guys. No, no, no! Of the of the good guys, the um, it's got like a, a tiger looking face, yeah. or a cat looking face. Yeah, um, Archer. I don't remember his name. Archer, that's him. Yeah, um, I had to think of his phrase. I was like, I am something leader of the Gorgonauts. Yeah. Man, he 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 goes for like one hundred and fifty bucks now. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I, I I wish I had have picked up that entire set um, yep. of toys. Uh, yeah, not for any investment reason. I just, you know, I. I, I wanted them then and I passed on it and I still want them now and now I can't afford them. So, yeah. yeah. It was, I had I had Archer. I had the big one that talked. And I tell you, like, as a kid, because I, I, I just think that's one of those movie phenomenons, like that one in episode two, for some reason, or episode one of Star Wars, like, I, I have, like, very distinct memories of those movies coming out and, like, all the kind of fast food tie-ins around it and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, yeah. And I got that figure for Christmas because I was like, oh, this is, you know, I could play with my G.I. Joes. And he was like just slightly too tall to play with G.I. Joe, the one I had. And it just was really not a good figure. He couldn't really hold his weapons very well. And just, you know, I don't know. I always wanted Chip Hazard. Like, because I, I, leading up to the movie, I didn't understand that the, the, the uh, soldiers were the bad guys. No, I don't I think I did either. I don't think I did either. But yeah. Yeah. That's, it, that movie, that one and Jingle All the Way with Arnold are, are very, they're more relevant now than they were when they were released. Like, <laughs> you watch Small Soldiers now and you're like, oh, these toys suck because of corporate meddling. Hmm. Yeah. So here's a confession I have never watched Jingle All the Way. I've oh, never seen it. Yeah. It's, it's corny. It's got, it's got the really bad jokes in it, but. You watch these people going nuts and everything's selling out, and this guy desperately <laughs> looking for one toy, and people getting into fights over it. You're like, oh wow, they they knew where it was headed. So. Yeah, yeah. The um, um, I always I always thought Toy Story two was a was a good film when mm -hmm. you know Woody gets acquired by this you know collector who wants to right. restore him and resell him. I always thought that was. Interesting. I didn't really like the depiction that you know the toy collector was kind of the villain of the, of the film, mm -hmm. um, but I um, I do enjoy the Forty Year Old Virgin as a comedy film. Mm -hmm. I really don't like the way um, they made him the into way a they, toy collector. They made him into a toy collector, and that uh, you know. 
he basically like <laughs> to, to lose his virginity and become a man or whatever part of that sort of journey that he goes on is having to sell all of his toys like mm -hmm. uh, that, that's that's a very ob I, i've often considered like uh, doing a video on the channel ab about that um mm -hmm. yeah odd. That'd, be a, that'd be a good video kind of talk about the stigma that surrounds it and how the because uh, growing up the the only stigma i had for things like that was comic book guy from the simpsons who's very much a caricature and that's like <laughs> yeah, all, yeah, everyone yeah. on that show is they it's everything's dialed up to 11 but it's like yeah. the, the movie 40 year old virgin which was such a hit in terms of a comedy it just yep. didn't do any favors for anybody i think but uh, speaking of it's, toy story go ahead it, it, it's funny when i did the pallet talk the other day with um liar convoy um mm -hmm. ryan um, I think it was a super chat or a question. Uh, Ryan Farnham from you know Laser Pants from the Infinity Equation. He was asking, you know, what what would you say to people today who tell you that playing with toys is is childish and all that? And I, I made some comment about like you know my military service, I can do what I want. But to actually, uh, and I don't know if Ryan's still in the chat, but I'll, if if he isn't, I'll tell him to go and watch the, watch this bit again because I want to really expand on that answer. Mm -hmm. So in the 1990s, certainly it was when I got out of the Australian Army and returned back to Perth would have been 1998 and I think that year or the following year as I bought my first display cabinet and um, set up all my – all I had at the time was Action Man stuff and I had it set up in, in the spare room and um, I had a lot of friends at the time then would really try and make fun of me. Not, not, not that I'm someone who really gets embarrassed anyway, but you know, when you've been in the military, you learn how to, to, how to take a few jokes, but um, people thought it was, it was weird. It was odd mm -hmm. um, to the point where all these years later, like when I started the YouTube channel, I didn't tell any of my military friends I was doing it. I didn't tell anybody locally, um, but I think a lot of it to do with the MCU over the last 10 years, all of a sudden there are these people I've known a lot of, you know, for most of my life who are claiming that, you know, they've always been a huge Captain America fan or whatever. And it's like, no, nah, man, you were one of the guys who would, you know, take, take the piss out of me when I was younger. Cause I collected mm -hmm. action man figures. Um, but I've really gotten to a point in my life now where, First of all, I just don't give a fuck what other people think. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, clearly don't. Um, but, yeah, I, I kept the YouTube channel secret for a long time, and then, you know, word started to get out around, certainly around the local town. I have not had a single person ever, you know, look at me or make a comment where they think it's weird or it's childish or, or it's odd. Um, and I think maybe that's because of, the YouTube channel as opposed to it. Cause if they see that there and see the, the time and energy and passion that I kind of put into those videos. How, yeah. How, how does, how does someone make fun of you for that? But at the end of the day, I, I, I am who I am and, and you know, people at work, you know, they, they know I have a military background and all that kind of thing. And I, I just, I, <laughs> I don't know anyone at work who would actually try and make fun of me. So, <laughs> right, uh. yeah, that's. A, I have a a family member of mine who who casually and subtly either gives backhanded compliments or uh, kind of berates me for collecting toys. And this person, uh, they collect books. That's their thing. They collect and read books, and they're like, "Well, I don't see why you you know waste your money buying all these toys." I'm like. I don't know why you waste your money buying books that you're going to read one time. Yeah. And everyone collects something, you know. So they, should, they should just let us enjoy our joy, Tony. <laughs> uh, Let's see. Uh, James Altsberg has a super chat. Thank you very much. And he says, he saw a 40-year-old virgin with his first wife. She asked if I would have sold mine. I told her I had Joe before I had her, and I'd have him after. 1975 Kung Fu talkers still do. Nice. Yep. Nice. Yeah. Um, it's interesting when I, when I kind of first, um, I, I, I knew my, my wife for a, a, a few years before we actually developed a relationship. We were part of the same circle of friends in Thailand. And 
the majority of my collection was at my parents' house in Australia when I was living in Thailand, and I just had a handful of things on, on the shelf. Um, and when we first basically started dating and then sometime later she kind of moved in with me, um, it was actually when I had taken sort of nine months off work to do the Story of Action Man documentary. So she always thought it was a bit – I was always on the computer work. You know, she I told her I was doing this this documentary thing. It was about toys. She always kind of thought it was a bit, a bit weird. But then when she then moved to Australia and we got into our own place and I got all excited about opening up all these boxes of toys that have been in storage for ages – I remember her turning around one day. She she came home from the shops and I was in like the kitchen dining area and the kitchen bench and the dining table and all over the floor was just action man stuff everywhere where I was going through it all, um, trying to reorganize it because it had been in storage for quite some time, pretty much for the four years I'd been in Iraq. And I remember her just walking in going, oh, no, what what have I gotten into here? <laughs> um, she, she does... Uh, probably over the last six months or so. Um, she's like, you know, it, this collection is getting enormous. Like, what, what are you doing? We're, we're having space issues. I was like, yeah, I know, but I can't help it. <laughs> uh, mm -hmm. But she would never she'd never make me get rid of it. Um, she knows how much I enjoy it. Mm -hmm. That's uh, the way I look at it. And I kind of agree with uh, James here. It's like, toys were here before you were, you know. Yeah. You need like I don't know that anyone who would ask their their spouse or their significant other like uh, you need to get rid of this stuff like all right well uh, bye yeah. like not not that you know toys are more important than a human life or anything like that but it's like you're asking like you're asking me to give up something I enjoy just like it like when someone says that you can't be friends with another with them and another person <laughs> you know what what kind of asshole makes you choose between like it's a no brainer like someone yeah. says you pick between me and him and the other guys like I don't care what you do exactly and I and I'll always side with that with that person so mm -hmm. it's it, it's it's funny I, I think like um let's let's let's, let's take a, a guy my age who's maybe been married for 15 years he's got a couple of kids mm -hmm. And then all of a sudden, because he watched, you know, for some reason he thinks The Last Jedi is good. You know, he's one of the, like, the th three people on Earth. Um, actually, there's probably more than that. But um, And then he turns around and says to his wife, I'm going to start toy collecting. Like, that's a discussion that you have to have with, with mm -hmm. your wife around finances and stuff like that. But for someone like me who's pretty much been a lifelong collector and you meet a person – you're already a collector and it's like grace would never tell me to to stop doing this because it's 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 my thing like it's it's part of who i am mm -hmm. um and even to to a degree like the, the youtube channel has become part of who i am as well it's um you know i, I but before that i used to go fishing a lot and she would uh she would complain because i was you know, we'd have a weekend off together and she'd barely see me because I'd go out crack of dawn in the morning. I'd go out fishing with friends and come back later and she's at home on her own. At least now, like, we might be in separate rooms or whatever, but, you know, she'll be relaxing, watching the TV or she does a lot of cooking and I'm in another room filming a video or, or editing or whatever and at least at least I'm home. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Sorry about that. I had to clear my throat. And that's uh, a discussion I've had with people before, like, because I've had co-workers try to rib me about it and all that. And I've had, you know, I've been with my old lady now for over three years, so I haven't really had to worry about much of it. But people are always like, they'll, I, I love it when people ask a question about you with you in the room, like you're not there. And people are like, does, does it bother you when he collects toys? And I usually chime in like, well, I mean, I could be spending it on a, you know, I could be shooting it into my arm or I could be, you know, running yeah, around yeah. like I could be running around town on her with that money, but I don't have that kind of money now. Like it's something I can focus on and it doesn't distract from her at all. So Yeah. Yeah, Gojatron says here in the in the chat, it says my my he, he and his wife have an unspoken agreement. I don't complain about the shoes, she doesn't complain about the toys. <laughs> yeah, Grace uh Grace, yeah, Grace likes her, her her clothes and and stuff, but she's also very very generous you know we we, we have a, uh, a a joint account but we we, we both work so we, you know portions of our of our salaries you know we just 
I keep some of mine. She keeps some of hers. She does what she likes with it. Um, she's very generous. She buys me and my son a lot of stuff as well. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, but she she does spend a lot of our like joint money. She likes to when she cooks food. If she's cooking Thai food, mm-hmm. she'll cook a Thai meal for me, my son, and her. And then you you, you go to um, and she sort of does it where you know there'll be a rice in one pot and the curry mm-hmm. in another pot and whatever. Mm-hmm. And you kind of go up and you do the portion yourself. And I go up and I'm like, there is. There is so much Thai green curry here. Like, who's this for? And she's like, I'm going to take all the leftovers into work tomorrow for all the people at work. And you're like, leftovers? You made enough for 15 people. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and uh, yeah, and so I, I keep buying everyone at work lunch, and they don't even they don't. We're in we work at the same place, but in different departments. So half those people don't even know who I am, <laughs> and I'm buying them lunch all the time. Uh, she's making it. I'm paying for it. Hmm. Yeah, that's uh, yeah. That's, uh, I don't think I've ever met, uh, and this isn't meant in any type of way, it's just an observation I've made over the course of my time on this earth. I don't yeah. think I've ever met a woman who can cook for just like one or two people. Like all the women in my family, it's always like, you come in for dinner, like, or, you know, is grandma coming? No. I'm like, then why is there food for a family reunion <laughs> on the table? Like, well, it's like whatever whatever they make, I hope you like it because you're going to be eating that for the next week. So. Yeah. Yeah, well, I, I do know one person like that, and that's my own mum. Mm-hmm. I, I always complained as a child that actually, like, she would literally cook just enough for the, for the three kids and to the point where I would be like, the portions are too small. And she's like, that's it. That's all we can afford. And... <laughs> Um, but yeah, certainly not great. It's part of the Thai culture as well. Like mm-hmm. uh, we'll have friends come round, not even for for a dinner party, just come round for a couple of drinks, maybe on a Friday afternoon. Um, and then they're like, "No, no, don't worry about doing food. <clears throat> don't worry about doing food, Grace. You know, we'll just we'll come round after dinner and we'll just have a couple of drinks and hang out." Mm-hmm. And people will turn up, and she'll have you know massive cheese platters organised and. In fact, people come around here for dinner when they do come for dinner. We're getting right off toys now, but they'll, they'll come around here for dinner and they'll, you know, Grace will do a lot of Thai food and mm-hmm. they'll have this enormous meal and they'll be stuffed full and they really enjoy it. And then when they go to leave, they get given takeaway containers like, here, take that for lunch tomorrow, some more mm-hmm. leftovers. So, mm-hmm. yeah, she does. Uh, she, she, she never likes to see people go hungry. So, yeah, that's a, a good characteristic to have, I think. Yeah. It's, very, it's a very nurturing, very caring kind of attitude. Yeah, so, very much so. But to circle back to toys before I start getting too hungry because I love Thai food. Um, <laughs> so uh, we're talking about play and evolution and all that. I wanted to know um, kind of how, how this is going to sound like a very dumb question, but I'll, I'll try to refine it as much as I can. Like, how did you play with your toys? Like, um, were, were there certain toys that lended themselves to kind of the smash and bang, just smack them together playing, or was it a more intricate, like delicate kind of play style? Or because I, I was very much like, if I break this, I'm not getting another one kind of thing. So everything was very delicate, kid gloves playing, like kind of posed and a lot of dialogue. And some of my friends yeah. would just smash their stuff together and they'd be all cracked and scuffed and scratched. and yeah, I, I, I was a p- pretty careful playing with my toys as, as a kid. Um, I didn't like to, to break them, scuff them. I didn't like them to have paint loss, to have stickers fall off, anything like that. The, the couple of toys I, I I do think I kind of played a bit rough with were probably Masters of the Universe, um, mm-hmm. just when the figures would be battling because they are, um, well, at the time, they were kind of quite, quite solid. Mm-hmm. Um, the other toy was definitely my 12 inch Mego Incredible Hulk because that mm-hmm. toy is solid as a damn rock. Right. Um, um, but yeah, if, if, everything else I was really very, very careful with. And like I said, we would have cardboard boxes for different toys. And I was always, certainly as I got a bit older as well, like by the age of like nine, when I was still heavily playing with toys. Um, I very, very rarely lost accessories. I can remember um, I had got, I'd gone to my, I don't know if I'd gone to my grandparents' house for the weekend or if we'd gone away. We were kind of staying with my grandparents and 
they must have bought me the nomad figure from the Rambo line or someone mm -hmm. had while we were away. Cause it's not, it's not a figure I would have taken with me. I would have taken an action man or I would have taken, you know, if I was going to the grandparents for the weekend, I would have actually taken Rambo if I could only take one figure, but I happened to have nomad. So I think it was bought for me that weekend. And then um, we went for a, you know, for a, for a walk in the woods or whatever it was. My, my, my grandma on my mum's side, um, did a lot of oil painting and she loved to do bird watching and stuff like that. So she would always enjoy taking us out for walks in the country. And I can distinctly remember having this brand new nomad action figure and playing with him near a little ditch in the woods. And I lost the, he had, um, he had a, a knife sheath that strapped around his ankle. Mm -hmm. um, I lost the knife out of the sheath and I realized I'd done it at the time. And I can remember, spending you know more than half an hour in this ditch trying to find this accessory that had, that had fallen out and you know obviously it was easily camouflaged in, in the dirt and I never found it mm. um but yeah I was I was very careful it was unusual that I would take a Rambo toy out with me which is why I'm pretty certain it had been bought for me while I was on this weekend trip away so mm -hmm. yeah that was uh I know I know that feeling all too well you're like yeah. I, you, uh, I just had it and it just disappears and gone forever. Yeah. Um, so there, there's something new that I wanted to try out. And it was something I've been thinking about. And uh, I wanted to know, because um, there's always tropes. Like whenever there's like a team of you know characters, there's, there's the strong, dumb one, the smart computer one, the hero, and like the love interest to that hero that's on the team. And then like the silent, like deadly one. You know, there's always a troop or a trope to that team. And I didn't, yeah. I, I didn't want to. So, sorry to interrupt you, but mm -hmm. as you were just going through those different tropes, for some reason, I started thinking about the retro blasting crew on a live stream. Going. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Melinda's a love interest. Michael's the hero. Mm -hmm. Tim's the computer guy. And Aaron's the one with the deadly skills. <laughs> mm -hmm. Sorry. I didn't mean to interrupt, but I had to. Yeah, that's out. fine. Yeah, that's, and I, I didn't want to put you on the spot and be like, okay, who's your favorite character from this? Who's your favorite character from that? Blah, blah, blah. I, I wanted to know if there was like a trope that you kind of gravitated towards, like uh, you, whatever movie or franchise or, you know, fictional team, like you had, you tended to pick that one was your favorite character from that, that team. Yep. Yep. Yeah. Um, very much. I think I've always more leaned towards kind of like the deadly anti-hero type character mm -hmm. um, rather than your, um, you know, traditional classic hero like mm -hmm. Superman or Luke Skywalker. Mm -hmm. As much as I love those characters, um, Snake Eyes from G.I. Joe, mm -hmm. you know, those deadly skills. That's why I like Rambo so much. Mm -hmm. um, and, I, and I fell in love with Rambo after what I watched first blood when I was around seven or eight years old. Mm -hmm. Um, and I didn't get to see the, the next Rambo for a long time. And that just became my all time favorite film at the age of seven. Um, you know, he's a real anti-hero in that. Mm -hmm. Um, I've often leaned towards the Punisher, mm -hmm. um, kind of characters like that. It's also kind of what I like about Indiana Jones as well, because he's not a complete, like, true blue out and out hero mm -hmm. um um you know they're, 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 I, I believe in the original kind of concept um they were going to portray him much more as a, as a guy he was going to have a problem a, a bit of a problem with alcohol or you know a bit of a drinker and uh, a womanizer kind mm -hmm. of thing so uh so yeah but it, uh, for me i think it's always been the, the character with like the deadly skill trope, you know, the snake eyes, the John Rambos of the world, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's uh, my, I tend to like the, the strong dumb one. Usually, <laughs> yeah, yeah. usually. And, and to, to kind of touch on a, a subject uh, for Iconicon, this is a, a little teaser for the people listening. Uh, yeah. I've been really thinking about the tropes and the characters I tend to gravitate towards, like the strong, silent, like kind of the uh, uh, the peaceful giant, so to speak. Yeah, I, I tend to gravitate towards those 
because I grew up with an older brother who was significantly older and bigger than me. And so I was never strong enough to fight back if he started to beat up, like beat me up or anything. And I think I gravitated toward the towards those characters because that's what I wanted to be. I wanted to be so big and strong that no one could beat me up anymore. Yep. And I think because kids imprint on these characters, like they they gravitate or they that's what they want to be, kind of thing. So I would yeah think that's that might be why I was so into that trope. So my, my, my older brother, he's six years older, which is mm-hmm. constru- is a big age gap when you're young. Right. Um, he's also, he, he's my half brother. We've got the same mum, different dads, mm-hmm. and he's got a lot of his dad's genes. So he was all, obviously always bigger than me as, as a child because he was six years older. But even now as adults, I'm like five, ten and a half, five, eleven, something like that. I actually think I'm shrinking now. Mm-hmm. Um, but he's six two. Um, he's always been bigger than me. Mm-hmm. But, you know, growing up, Certainly in England, growing up, my brother never, ever, never beat me up. He never bullied me, nothing. He, if, if, if anything, he he just didn't pay me much attention. <laughs> um, uh, so it's, it's one of those. We actually, we didn't have a lot to do with each other when we were, when we were younger because of, there was such a big age gap. I've got a younger sister who's a little less than two years younger than me. So it was always... Mm-hmm. You know, Saturday mornings, there would be me and my sister, you know, fighting over the VHS player. Mm-hmm. And my brother would either be sleeping in or he'd be out with his friends. Uh, and it's weird. At, at, around the age of, like, 19, 20, um, we started to to go out a bit together, like, you know, go go to the, the pub and have a few drinks. We'd go to parties together and um, weirdly developed this really close bond much later in life, having gone from – not really knowing each other that well when we were kids or not having much interest in each other. And, and I think because we don't have that history of, you know, the older brother bullying the, the younger kid when he was younger, we've now become really, really close friends in, in later life. Mm-hmm. And we're two very, very different people. Um, you know, his interests are, he likes Formula One. I've got no interest in cars at all. Mm-hmm. Um, we've got all these different interests, and I think it's, we're so different. That's why we, we get along so well now. Mm-hmm. Uh, Tim Hayes, no, I've got a slightly younger sister, not an older sister. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, Shav Gold has another question for you. He asks uh, if you ever used your 12 inch figures as giants for your smaller figures. No, that was not something I I did. So my, my, my $6 million man figure, which was a hand me down from my brother, he he's about like an inch and a half taller than Action Man. That. I could just, you know, I could get away with that kind of scale difference in my imagination. Or you could just go, hey, he's a really tall guy. Mm-hmm. You know, there, there are tall people. Not, not everyone's the same height. Mm-hmm. Um, but no, um, maybe I, I, I do remember reading like Gulliver's Travels. And one time I don't ever remember like, you know, having Action Man being Gulliver and then having all the Action Force figures <laughs> being all the, uh, what are they called, Lilliputlians or whatever. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Yeah. So we're uh, over the two hour mark now. Um, and I, I like to play this game. Uh, I've, I've, I've played it <laughs> twice now. Um, it's not, it's not summing up in one. It's, uh, don't worry. Yeah. <laughs> Which is that, that talk about a hot seat. Um, <laughs> yeah. So what I, what I would like you to do is pick an age between say, you know, five and, you know, 12 and then pick whatever time of year you prefer and then run me through a day in that age and time of year for Tony like what like you woke up on you know a Saturday or whatever and just run me through okay. that well I'm gonna I'm gonna pick the summer of 1987 mm-hmm. um, we moved to Australia the following year the reason I'm gonna pick that is because it's probably the most distinct memory um, for me. And that was the year I was collecting Action Force International Heroes and particularly the summer. Uh, my birthday is in, in, in the summer. Um, I can actually remember the smell of freshly cut green grass um, at, at the school and everything. And so an, uh, an evening after school for me would be um, racing home from school and playing with, I only had a handful of action figures at the time. Um, I got a lot more, but by the end of the year, as in action force figures, um, 
but I, I, I would come home from, from school, you know, ditch the school bag, run upstairs to the bedroom, and I would uh, – <laughs> weirdly, I was so enamoured with the card backs for those figures, which is a copy of the G.I. Joe ones with the, mm-hmm. like, the digital explosion behind them, that every figure I had acquired up until that point, I did not want to cut the file card off the back. I had basically mm-hmm. carefully peeled the bubble away from the edge, and when I finished playing with them – I would put all the figures back into the bubbles. Mm-hmm. So I would get home from school and I had like a dresser drawer, sort of dresser drawers or something. And all the figures would be stood there in the card backs and I would take them all out. I'd take the accessories out and I would have playtime with them. And then when it came to, to dinner time, my, my parents are calling me downstairs for dinner. Um, I would go down, have a meal with the parents then go back upstairs and the figures would get carefully put back into the bubbles, all the accessories in, in the right place, and I would neatly display them because I just had this thing about how the visual impact those toys had when I saw them in a toy store for the first time and I wanted to recreate that in my bedroom. So mm-hmm. after dinner, they would all get displayed back in the in the packages and then I would pull out you know either the latest issue of Action Force Weekly or all of the issues – and I would start re- reading the comics and um, wishing and daydreaming for which other figures I would um, that I, I would acquire. I, I, had to, I think I made a mistake. I'm almost certain I made a mistake in the video I, I made about completing that Action Force collection where I kind of stepped out through the year which toys I got them when. I knew I wasn't going to get everything right. But I think I said that for for Christmas, I got Zartan and the Water Moccasin. That clearly was not the case because I'm pretty sure I got Zartan and the Swamp Skier. It must have been for my birthday because there's no way. Obviously, Zartan changes color in sunlight, the original vintage Mm -hmm. figure. If I had got him for Christmas, there's no way I would have gone outside. It's freezing cold in England at Christmas time, you know, snow Mm -hmm. and ice on the ground. And I can remember being in my backyard for hours and hours playing with Zartan because he changed color in sunlight. Mm-hmm. And that was, in fact, that's kind of answering another question from earlier, the toys that are played with indoors mm-hmm. and outdoors. Mm-hmm. Action Force was not an outdoor toy for me, except right. for Zartan, because he didn't change color in like from the light coming from a light bulb. It had to be sunlight. Mm-hmm. Um, and I remember it yeah, being a nice, hot, sunny day and playing with, and the Swamp Skier changed color as well. Um, and playing with that thing to absolute death in the backyard. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, they were good times. Good times. Yeah. That's a. Uh, uh, do you happen to recall um, the uh, the uh, file card for Zartan? Like, did you happen to get the one that had the whole mental health thing on the back, or did you get the one that was post that? I I don't think because everything that came out in England would have been at least one year, if not two years later. So like a lot of the stuff we were getting in 1987, Flint and Lady J and that kind of thing, that was like 1984 in the States. Mm -hmm. Um, So I don't remember, but I don't think that they ever released that file card on an action force box. Um, Cause they, they, they would have had at least a year or two to realize, you know, the, mis- the mistake Hasbro had made in, in the States with um, uh, the backlash to, what do they call him? A, a paranoid schizophrenic, I think mm-hmm. they said, mm-hmm. um, which, which, which upset some, some sort of mental health uh, communities. Um, understandably. Um, so yeah, I'm pretty certain that, the, that I don't think there has ever been a, a, a boxed action force international hero Zartan that actually had that file card on it. So mm-hmm. like, yeah. Which uh, actually leads me into uh, a question, which I'm, I'm eagerly awaiting your uh, your Destro video for obvious reasons. Mm-hmm. Um, as someone, you know, you, you grew up uh, across the pond, as we like to say, mm-hmm. and so you you had uh, Jackal before you had Destro. Yes. So when you became, uh, I shouldn't say became an adult collector, but when you started you know, kind of diving down other rabbit holes. When you see that character, is Jackal the first thing you think of, or do you see Destro, or do you, are they just two different characters to you? Um, I, 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 I see Destro, and, and the reason being that I, I never actually had Jackal as, as a child, and 
Um, and I was t talking about this on the live stream yesterday where I had the, the, the writer and the photographer of this new Action Force book. Mm -hmm. um, those guys, the writer and the photographer, are very, very different ages. One, the writer's much younger than me and the photographer's older than me. And one of the questions I asked him was, um, you know, I wanted to know kind of what age bracket he was in because he was so interested in the Battle Action Force comics. Well, mm -hmm. when I was getting the original Palatoy Action Force, when characters like the Jackal would have come out, I was five, six years old, and I really wasn't reading comics then. So I never had to figure as a child, didn't know the backstory in the Action Force comics. Um, so my first introduction to, to Destro was in issue one of Action Force Weekly in 1987 when he was Destro. So he's always Destro to me. But doing the research for this video, mm. um, because Palatoy... So, there was a comic in the UK called Battle, which was just a military theme comic that was really popular through the 70s and the 80s. Mm -hmm. And not when Action Force first came out in 82, where it was just mini Action Man, but in 83, when they introduced the Z Force, SAS Force, the enemy team, they started a storyline in the comic Battle, and it now became known as Battle Action Force. Mm. Well, so for the first couple of years, it was all Palatoy products. Then Palatoy, they shut down the design department and said, hey, we're not going to design our own toys anymore. We are just going to import, you know, toys from other companies. So they started to import G.I. Joe figures um, to the UK, still under like the Palatoy brand. So in the storyline, Baron Ironblood actually becomes Cobra Commander mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, in the story. And doing the research for this Destro video, what I didn't realise is when he does that, he betrays the Red Jackal mm. and... Uh, let me get this right. Cobra Commander then, yeah, basically he ends up fighting against the Red Jackal and, and co the, the Cobra Commander. Um, he does something to the to the Jackal. He injures him in some way and then turns him into, yeah, he, he, he feels pity for him and he turns him into Destro. And little did I know, Destro came out under the Palatoy Action Force line in 85, but I wasn't into Action Force that particular year. It was probably when I was into 18 or something else. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, so he's, he's, it's, it's very unusual. He started off as Red Jackal, much like Baron Ironblood, then became Cobra Commander. He became Destro in that storyline. But um, but yeah, for, for me, whenever I see that character, um, it's Destro and Red Jackal is just a, a, an, an obscure um, British variant action figure. It's not mm -hmm. a character thing for me. Okay, yeah, I've, I've always kind of wondered that because there are there's a few that you know they they they're the same character they just have a different name. Unlike, um, oh gosh, what what's it's uh, the blonde Scarlet? I can never remember Coral. Her name. Coral, Coral. Yeah. yeah, like that's that's a different character. Like it's different colors, yeah. different, like completely different. But something like yep. Jack, Red Jackal, it's like, okay, they painted his chest red and gave him a skull, but that's Destro. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, well, um, we're coming up to a close here. We're about to hit the two and a half hour mark. I uh, wanted to ask uh, just some of your, because uh, we, we've kind of been dancing around it and touched on it a little bit with the, the little game, your fondest memories of playtime, like, looking back on them now like as a kid you know you're, you're just having fun and playing but as an adult uh looking back on them what do you think was the best part or your fondest memory of playing oh the, man I, I could give i could give you a whole list of things mm -hmm. all right he here's a really fond memory and i don't know if i've shared this story on the channel or not before but um Obviously, a lot of people have heard over the years that I was inspired to become a collector because my dad's a collector. Mm -hmm. uh, he's a collector of die-cast metal soldiers, and he would display them in glass cases. And I can remember around 1986 or 87 um, watching my dad do that. I was like, I, I, I already knew at that age, like eight years old, that I was going to be a toy collector. And I was already envisioning that, you know, I can't wait till I'm an adult and I can display all my toys like this. But where my – and although I've, I've ended up now displaying my toys exactly the same as my dad, you know, the way they were 
Mm-hmm. Um, I, I don't show customized action man figures. I show them the way they were sold and I put them in glass cases. But at the time I was like, no, no, no. I'm, I, maybe I've been to a museum or something that had some dioramas built. I don't know. But, but I had this idea that when I became older, I wanted to display, I wanted to have a huge collection of action man and I wanted to display them in dioramas. So I can remember getting every single action man figure and vehicle and accessory that I had and then borrowing it a load more stuff from all the other kids in the street. Um, I got them to come around to my house and you would walk through the front gate into the front yard and all the way down the pathway to the to the front door. You could do like a circle through the front yard where we had set up all these different little displays and we were trying to get all the parents from the street to come round, and we were trying to charge them 50 pence to come in and have a look at our <laughs> action man display in the, in the front yard. And I, I, I look back at that now and just go, I was always going to be a toy collector. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I, I, I very much like to, I like to, as I got older, I really like to set up displays, but not quite so much play with them. Mm-hmm. Um, but the other fond memories of mine are, are really, I've got really fond memories of having the X Wing and the TIE Fighter and literally holding one in each hand and getting dizzy running around in the, in the living room, having Darth Vader chasing Luke Skywalker, mm-hmm. that kind of thing. But, uh, you know, um, I think another one would be my very early childhood um, playing in the bath with the Fisher-Price adventure team, um, <laughs> adventure people, the, the submarine, that kind of thing. But bath time was always, um, I, I don't know, I don't know how, how often that happened when I was a kid, whether it was like every second day or, or something. Because, um, But back in those days in England, like we didn't have a shower in the house. Showers weren't yeah. a big thing. Everyone had baths. Mm-hmm. Um, and because of the cold weather, you didn't sweat quite so much. So a lot of people would have a bath like every two or three days. And you, you would wash in the sink. You know, that was how mm-hmm. it was kind of done in England. So bath time was a once or twice a week kind of special event. And um, the original Orange Action Force Frogman, which is the first Action Force figure I ever got, mm-hmm. I, I can't believe how much enjoyment I got out of that single three and three quarter inch scaled figure. Um, it was I, I think prior to that, <clears throat> I wasn't a huge fan of bath time. And my mum was like, this is the best what £1.50 I've ever spent because he wants mm. to go in the bath all the time now. So, yeah. Yeah. Bath time toys had a uh, very special play. Like, I found yeah. like once a toy went to the bath, it stayed there. Like It never occurred to me because we it wasn't that we had a plethora of bathrooms, but you know, my parents had their master bathroom, and then the rest of us kids had the bathroom, and the tub was just lined with toys. Like whatever went in there, kind of stayed in there. How, how some people collect empty shampoo bottles because they don't throw them away after they're done, and we had toys all along the side of the tub. And <laughs> yeah, so, but yeah, so. I'm I'm pretty certain that Fisher Price set with the helicopter and the submarine. Mm-hmm. I think you're right. I think that got. Taken into the into the bath and uh, and it lived in the bathroom for for the rest of my childhood pretty much mm-hmm. until it disappeared somewhere. Mm-hmm. It was I had uh, I don't know who who made it, but I had this rubber squid like a squeaky toy that you'd find at like a souvenir shop. I had yeah. a squid and uh, the Cobra Night Landing. Only it, it wasn't the Night Landing; it was the same toy, but it was all in black and it was. Uh, Toys R Us, like it came with the uh, uh, shipwreck, uh, but yep. the Navy SEAL version of shipwreck, and that's that was my my go to bath time. Is the squid would come at it and attack the boat and pull the boat underwater, and yep. it was it was a lot of fun. And uh, <laughs> I'll never forget watching his weapons go boo, down the drain. <laughs> so, yep. But, so. We've reached the the two and a half hour mark, Tony. Is there anything else that you would like to talk about? Any other memories or anything you feel that we haven't discussed that we should before we leave? Uh, just 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 one other very distinct memory, mm-hmm. um, which I have shared before, but you know I haven't shared it with your audience, mm-hmm. um, and that's just the um, uh, I went into I went into hospital to have an operation done when I was around five years old. 
Um, I had to have a surgery. And I don't remember the surgery, anything like that, but I distinctly remember waking up from the surgery and my parents giving me this very large Action Force card back that had the um, the AF-9 snowmobile and the Arctic Trooper with it. Mm -hmm. um, and it's one of those... It wasn't a birthday gift. It wasn't a Christmas gift. It was because I'd gone through this horrendous surgery. I've still I've got an enormous scar across my belly now. I had an undescended testicle that needed to get cut out. And remember, not to get too graphic, but mm -hmm. you know, I don't remember the surgery. Um, but uh, that, that's one of those memories that will stick with me for the rest of my life because it was so. To be, I, I have now reacquired that toy, but I don't have it mint on the card. And mm -hmm. if if someone said to me now, would you go through another surgery to get that mint on the card? I probably would, mm -hmm. <laughs> depending on the how invasive the surgery was. Right. Um, but I, 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 I'm not a huge packaged collector. That is one packaged sealed item that I would love to add just because of that memory. Um, you know, I've got a mint complete toy uh, courtesy of. Um, of Gary Atkinson, I purchased it from him last year. Um, but to have that on the original large card back would be amazing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a, I have a very similar memory going through surgery and waking up with people giving me toys in the hospital bed. And I'm just so lost in the saw, still under anesthesia, like, oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, but, all right. Well, I think everyone for showing up tonight. We had a very lovely turnout. And Tony, I want to thank you so much for taking time out of your evening to come on again. It was a blast. And I'm so thankful that you came. My um, pleasure. For those listening, um, please don't forget to go to Analog Toys and subscribe if you haven't, which if you're here and you haven't subscribed to Analog Toys, that's I don't know what's wrong with YouTube, but <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> So uh, the links to Tony's channel, his Patreon, his merch store, the Facebook page, and the Instagram are all in the description below. So it's a one-stop shop. Uh, I actually got my Analog Toys t-shirt today. Um, nice. I've, been I've been holding out waiting for uh, Coyote Brown so I can wear it with my uniform, but I haven't found it yet. <laughs> so because all you see is that, that top part of the shirt. So yeah, you know, they'd never know. Also, yep. speaking of merch and the like, uh, Iconicon is right around the corner. Um, it, it feels like just yesterday we started having meetings on it, and now we're less than two months away, about a month and a half away. Yeah, it's coming up quick, yeah. man. I'm, um, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm starting to panic. You know, I've, I've committed to a couple of produced videos. I need to get to work on them. So mm -hmm. that's. I, I did those those first two, and this third one's going to be a doozy. And I'm like, I'm, I'm, I'm like sweating bullets because it's got it's a whole process i've never tried before and it's yeah. hopefully i can pull it off so don't forget about iconicon everyone listening it's gonna be five days of more content than you could possibly handle so yeah yeah if, if you if you really are you know one of these um really passionate toy fans who likes youtube channels like mine and two cents toys and retro blasting I highly recommend recommend taking some time off work. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, I think at the I think the schedule. I think we're starting on the Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. We're starting around two p.m. and running through to midnight, and then on mm -hmm. on the weekend we're doing eight a.m. to midnight, Saturday and Sunday. Mm -hmm. And it'll be, you know, there'll be breaks between streams, but not a lot. You know, fifteen minutes to thirty minute breaks. So you're going to get hour and a half panels and. Um, tons and tons of content. We've got lots to do, and I think we've got a meeting next week, so mm -hmm. I'll have to check the date, yeah. yeah to, to put it in context, if what you're getting now is just a regular you know, dinner or lunch or whatever, Iconicon is going to be Gracie cooking. Yeah, it's yeah. Gonna, <laughs> it's going to be a lot for everybody and for days to come. So. Yeah, it'll be one of those Thai festivals that, uh, you know, nothing. they don't do anything in Thailand on a single day. It's like it ends up going over four or five days. So, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, awesome. So, well, uh, I thank everyone for coming out tonight and spending time with us. Thank you so much for everyone who showed up, and we will catch you later.
Thanks, guys. Yeah. Thanks for having me. Cheers. Thank you.